Number 10, punishment first. Innocent until proven guilty in a court of law, right? That's that's how it goes. How do you know I drank the milk? <laughs> There's no milk on my face. How do you know? There, there'd probably be milk on my face. Not so much in ancient Egypt. While there is some evidence of jails existing, it is clear that they much preferred an immediate and swift justice. By that, I mean flogging, mutilation, removing limbs, uh, that sort of thing. A lot of these punishments were overseen by a vizier. In today's terms, it's sort of like a governor or official who had the power to oversee things like punishment through. Or at least held the most power besides the pharaoh, which, hey, that's a lot of power. While it may be an effective system for keeping prisons empty, no one should lose fingers for sliding a couple double bubbles in their pocket. That's just my opinion. Number 9. Prisoners while the promise of losing a limb the second you're caught taking a cookie from the cookie jar, boy I've been there, is a great deterrent, prison can also work sometimes. It should be noted that Egypt developed a system of law and order 4,000 years ago, which is, well, a long time ago and very impressive. For anyone taking the bar exam, that should be your answer under why take on law. Because the Egyptians did it first, why not? They do it, it's probably cool. So it makes sense that they did have some prisons. There's depictions of prisoners and drawings and figurines, surprisingly, oftentimes having their arms bound to their back like a good episode of Cops. And a leash around their neck with ropes and, uh, well, it just looks a little strange and weird. Given that most criminals were done on the spot, it's not hard to imagine that the Egyptians were cruel to their prisoners, and they were, it was not good. They should be canceled, that should be canceled, them. Number eight, court. Believe it or not, they also had some sort of makeshift court as well. Who would have thought? No hammer and gavel, and certainly no Saul Goodman or Judge Judy, but hey, without those, I'd argue what the heck's the point of the American justice system in the first place, right? Ah, oh, boy. But they were simple processes, to say the least. During the Middle Kingdom period, judges were appointed to decide on verdicts before well, it was usually priests, so I, I, I prefer a judge doing that, honestly. Except in this court, no one is legally represented by anyone. Yeah, that's right. There's no lawyers, but there was a jury and there were witnesses. Unfortunately, they were often beaten until, well, they said the truth or uh, the desired truth. Number seven, police. Bad boys, bad boys. What are you gonna do? Yes, that's right. Ancient Egypt may have had the first police force in history. Who would have thought? I actually didn't know that. I mean, sure, the vizier is great and all, but he can't possibly go around arresting everyone. He'd be at this all day. He can't do that. So it's only natural that you hire a bunch of dudes to do it for you. Can't get them all, but you can get some of them. While they did provide some limited support to communities and crime in towns, most of their arrests were made against those who were a little too greedy and thought grave robbing, well, the many sacred tombs around would make for an easy payday. It didn't. Number six, bloodhounds and baboons. That's a weird title. This one is so weird, but okay, here we go. We've all seen the movies where there's a crook, a perp, or someone who's trying to outrun the law. Andy Dufresne was right. You gotta crawl through a lot if you want your freedom. I remember Andy Dufresne. Anyway, well, in these scenes, there was a good chance that law enforcement has dogs with them. Oh, yeah, see, I'm getting somewhere with this. There's also a good chance that those dogs were bloodhounds. Cute dogs, actually, but the reason they bring them along is because they have a great nose. They can sniff a scent and follow it for miles, oftentimes leading to the crook. Smart dogs. What if I told you though that this sort of thing existed in ancient Egypt, except that it wasn't dogs, it was baboons. Yeah, who would have thought? Yes, that's right. There's depictions of police with baboons assisting in the work with crooks and or criminals. It's all jokes until Diddy Kong shows up to arrest you. Now it's DK time, baby. Uh-oh. Number five, fake beards. I can't grow a beard, so maybe I'll just start rocking the, the fake one. You know, like Hatshepsut. Long before Cleopatra, Hatshepsut was the first woman to obtain power as a pharaoh. She was the sixth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. There were just a few that were women in total, but during her reign back in the mid 1400s BC, following the death of Thutmose II, she was determined on being portrayed as a male. The pharaoh, fake beard, the massive muscles, historians believe that this was all done as an act of politics. After her passing, come 1458 BC, her stepson took the throne, Thutmose III, and he destroyed everything in her name and image. Well, mostly everything. Now we have this bearded pharaoh that we're pretty sure we figured out. Number four, acne. Ancient Egyptians came up with uh, an interesting method on getting rid of those pimples, that's for sure. Remind you, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing, so 
again creative. Physicians back then discussed pimples as these elevated spots with black tops that can plague your skin from four to five years. And by squeezing these spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were called maggots back then. Imagine your partner, hey, can you get this pimple on my back? Yeah, I think I got some maggots in there. I don't know. I'd be sick. See ya. Now we're single. They would refer to severe cases of acne as maggots that lie in a bed of roses. Hey, if a physician ever told me I had maggots that lie in a bed of roses on my persons, I would faint. That's the scariest news I've ever heard in my life. That's some bad news, man. Dermatological disorders were thought to be human skin taking on the properties of animals. Yeah. Oh, you have acne? Hmm. Are you sure you're not turning into a bird? Maybe it's that. Come back next week. Ancient Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds, all to get rid of acne, hopefully. Sorry, maggots, not acne. Maggots. All to get rid of maggots. I'm gonna go throw up. Number three, prosthetics. The ancient Egyptians were a culture of firsts and some of their achievements we still have no idea how they were able to accomplish. Like the pyramids? I couldn't tell you. Could you? Didn't think so. Hit that thumbs up. We're both wrong. We're both learning. It's very likely that some of the first ever prosthetics were used in ancient Egypt. How fascinating. Imagine being the first guy to make a toe, a fake toe. A female mummy who was discovered near Luxor had her death dated somewhere between 950 and 710 BCE. And she was also found with a prosthetic toe made from wood and leather on her person. While this of course is a wonderful cosmetic replacement and it's no secret that the ancient Egyptians certainly valued aesthetics, it seems as though this prosthetic toe was completely functional and was actually used to help this woman walk. The toe, after it was discovered, had significant signs of wear and tear, which then inspired experts to start a study, look a little further, and they did. So they took participants and tested their gait, both with and without the use of a replicated toe, and in ancient Egypt, the common footwear were sandals, and walking in them would have been uh, next to impossible without a big toe. So it's clear that this prosthetic was very helpful and important to those similar to this Luxor mummy. Not exactly a beauty practice, but I'm sure they also felt a little more confident with that toe. This is also too impressive to exclude. Beauty list. I'm like, yeah, toes are beautiful. Why not? Throw them on. Number two, henna. I got henna done a few years ago and I totally blanked. I forgot that it lasted longer than like two days. I was like, day four, I'm like, what's going on, man? Is this permanent? While on one hand, pun intended, it is beautiful, ancient Egyptians' use of henna went beyond style and beyond imaging oneself after the gods. See, henna also has cooling effects on the body and ancient Egypt was, uh, was quite hot. It was used by ancient Egyptians to color their hair and fingernails in shades of red and orange. Now this shade, this exact shade, also provided comfort on hot days. Come back with some henna. Kind of nice. It lasts longer than a few days though, just so you know, if you want to get henna. It's important to know. That guy did not tell me in Greece. No, he did not. And finally, number one, deodorant. When it comes to deodorant, today we listen to the old spice guy. He's always whistling about something new. But long before he was born, ancient Egyptians used ostrich eggs for deodorant. They made perfumes and oils, this is commonly known, but they were also the first to use any type of a deodorant, like underarm deodorant. It was so impressive. Ostrich eggs mixed with a little fat and tamarisk and tortoise shell and then nuts, mix them all together and bam, there you go. You're ready for date night. Just apply all of that on your body. Another method was a little more yummy than ostrich eggs and nuts. See, Egyptians would also use porridge balls. How creative is that? Flavored porridge rolled up and safely tucked in in your underarm right there, right there on your little smelly chicken wing. This morning I had some deodorant just crumble apart when I was applying it. You ever have that happen? Turns to feta cheese all of a sudden, mid-application. Now my bathroom sink looks like a Greek salad. It smells great, but not practical. Might have to go back to the porridge ball method. Who knows? Maybe I have one right now. Maybe that's why I haven't moved this arm the whole time. Who knows? Number 10, false doors. Okay, right off the bat, imagine searching for a lost Egyptian tomb, all right? Imagine you've spent years of your life dedicating to this research, and then you find a door. You find an entrance carved into the wall, and this is it. What lies beyond? It's time. You try and carefully open it with a team of archeologists, but it won't budge, because it's a fake door. It's a false door. Yeah, just a Looney Tunes door. Somebody juked you out 4,500 years ago. Gotcha. Their spirit's been waiting that long to be like, nice, idiot. All right, we can go, we're good. False doors in Egyptian tombs were quite common in ancient Egyptian times. But if we look elsewhere throughout history, we find false doors in ancient Rome, in both tombs and the interior of homes. So that ought to be confusing for any house guests back then. It's also important to note that Egyptian culture was influenced by Mesopotamian architecture. So we've had fake doors around for a while now. A lot of confusing people for thousands of years. Ancient Egyptians believed that these false doors were a connection to the dead, and that spirits were able to travel here and there throughout living and death. Most false doors can be found on the West Wall because Egyptians believed the West to be the land of the dead. Number nine, the tomb of Uzer. Back in March 2010, the Egyptian Supreme Council of Antiquities released 
this photo. This six foot tall slab of pink granite was carved over 3,500 years ago, and this door was found near Karnak Temple in Luxor, and originally it belonged to the chief minister of Queen Hatshepsut back in the 15th century. Now, Uzer was a high ranking official and held the position of vizier for 20 years at that time, so in turn, he got his own fancy tomb located on the west bank of the Nile. Remember, Egyptians associate the west with the land of the dead. That's gonna come in quite a few times in this video. The actual slab of granite, this door, was found far away from its home. It had been moved thousands of years later and ended up in an ancient Roman era building. Never thought I'd have to say this, but um, don't steal doors from the dead. Got it? Okay, let's move on. Number eight, Alexandria Black Tomb. What if we found a tomb and then just opened it, you know? What if we found a mysterious black granite tomb in Alexandria, say back in 2018? Do you think it would be wise to just open it because we're curious? Spoiler alert, we opened it and it was exactly what we thought it was going to be. When archaeologists found this massive tomb untouched for over thousands of years, on one hand, yeah, that's a feat in itself, but us humans, we're curious creatures. We just gotta, just a little peek just to see who's in there. I mean, after all, it could be Alexander the Great, right? That's the whole point of all this. Egyptian news outlet El Watan reported that the tomb was lifted only a few centimeters before every official involved at that construction site just fled the scene. They straight up just ran away. It smelled that bad. Mustafa Waziri, Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities, this guy put his entire head in the tomb just to show us that it's safe. That's great. I mean, you could use your hand, maybe even a foot, I guess, just a little foot dip, but straight to the head dipping? Come on, Mr. Waziri, be smart about this. Number seven, Valley of the Kings. While March 2020 wasn't the best month of all time by any means, Egyptian officials did locate a secret vault hiding in the sands of the Valley of the Kings in Egypt. Just off the west bank of the Nile, the Valley of the Kings, as its name hints towards, is a pretty historical part of Egypt's past. Again, do we want to open this vault? Probably not, but did we? Yes. Bones and goo and history. What do you know? Surprise, surprise. Number six, 2020 tombs. Summer 2020, nice. While most of us was stuck inside watching Netflix, more than 100 sealed coffins were found. And yes, they were occupied for the most part. Found, of course, in Saqqara, Egypt, Egyptian archeologists have never been more excited. Maybe we'll find the body of Cleopatra. Wouldn't that just be dandy? The fact that we found over 100 of these still in great shape is mind blowing. Grave robbers have been around since ancient Egyptian days, and for all these to be untouched for this long is honestly unbelievable. These findings date back to 712 BC, which was a period where Egypt was controlled by foreign civilizations. That's what makes this so insane. Like Persians and Greeks, they were all around at this time. The idea that we're finding mummies is great and all, but again, do we need to open all them up? Maybe there's treasure, maybe there's bodies. Either way, it's not yours. <laughs> Am I insane? Maybe I'm insane. Do we need to find Alexander the Great this badly that we're willing to disrespect this many souls in the process? Number five, the lost labyrinth. Archaeologists uncovered what's believed to be the remains of a long lost labyrinth below the sand of the Pyramid of Hawara, known as, quote, the labyrinth. Built by Amenhet III, it was the most visited sites of the ancient world. Greek Herodotus claimed to have counted 3,000 rooms in the pyramid's funeral complex during the 5th century BC. According to them, the underground temple consists of over 3,000 rooms filled with remarkable hieroglyphics and paintings. Close, too, located less than 100 kilometers from Cairo. In 2008, with the aid of ground penetrating technology, a Belgian Egyptian expedition was able to confirm the presence of an enormous underground temple. With no visible remains, the story was thought to be a legend passed down until Egyptologists uncovered its foundations in the 1800s. The results of this expedition indicate the presence of grid-like structures deep beneath the sand. Please tell me there's no minotaur just running around down there. Okay. Number four, the mystery queen. Archaeologists have unearthed a tomb of a previously unknown queen believed to have been the wife of Pharaoh Neferefra, who ruled 4,500 years ago. The tomb was discovered in Abu Sur, an old kingdom necropolis southwest of Cairo, where there are several pyramids dedicated to the pharaohs of the fifth dynasty. The name of his wife had not been known until recently. She was Kenta Kaz, renowned as the mother of two Egyptian pharaohs. Kenta Kaz I is a mysterious woman who ruled in the fourth dynasty dynasty and has archaeologists puzzled at her burial complex in Giza. Though rough evidence for ancient Egyptian queens, the remains of this female leader were undisturbed for two millennia within the necropolis until its excavation in the late 1930s. Hieroglyphic inscriptions concerning her title had been discovered and subsequently became open for interpretation. Her title was initially regarded to be, quote, King of Upper and Lower Egypt and, quote, Mother of King of Upper and Lower Egypt. So who was this mysterious, powerful figure in ancient Egypt? Who was she? Number three, 
the dendrolites. All these tombs and underground chambers, how the hell did they see anything under there? Well, we really don't know, but we have some sort of direction. These ancient battery looking light bulbish things could have maybe been the power source. Ancient Egypt seems to be full of keyholes, drill holes, and shafts that are literally impossible without high powered tools. Most people say aliens, me included, but I also say the Dendera light bulbs. They've been theorized as being some sort of battery. The Hothor temple at Dendera contains several relief depictions, Harsimtus in the form of a snake emerging from a lotus flower. The Dendera light is a variation of this mode of showing Harsimtus in an oval container, a snake inside taking a number of humans to lift, and it holds apparent meanings of the start of creation. Look, I don't care what you say, this thing is a light bulb. It's got a filament. And coils? Come on, drill holes? They couldn't have just lit fires underground? The smoke? The heat? I don't think so. Now a couple of DeWalts. <laughs> Just sanding up the pyramids real nice, you know? Who knows? Who knows? Number two, the city of Punt. The land of Punt or the ancient city of Punt was an ancient kingdom sometime back then. A trading partner of ancient Egypt. It was known for producing and exporting gold, aromatic resins, precious stones, black wood, ivory, you name it. The region is known from ancient Egyptian records of trade expeditions. At time, Punt is referred to as the land of God. No pressure, archaeologists. The exact location of Punt is debated and unknown by historians. Q Indiana Jones movie. Various locations have been offered southeast of Egypt, a Red Sea coastal region, Somalia, Ethiopia, Sudan, no one really knows. First deciphered in Egyptian hieroglyphics in 1822, scholars began reading Egyptian texts and the mystery got mystery -er. That's not a word. More questions arose as to where Punt was located and what happened to it. The land of Punt is written by voyagers as being praised for its lavish riches and goodness of land. Okay, so it exists somewhere. This is awesome, isn't it? Would it suck if we already found everything? We're going on an expedition, boy. Grab your things, let's go. And coming into the number one spot, the Sphinx. Where do I even start? Known as the oldest carved rock like ever, its age is debated literally every day due to the questions it asks scholars. Was it wind erosion? Water erosion? How many times was this thing broken and rebuilt? The great Sphinx of Giza, the limestone statue of a reclining Sphinx, a mythical creature with a head of a human and a body of a lion. Facing directly west to east, it stands on the Giza Plateau on the west bank of the Nile. The face of the Sphinx appears to represent the pharaoh Khafra, although this is heavily debated as wrong gears and looking nothing like him. It's since been restored with tons of layers of limestone blocks, although still unfixed. Its nose was broken off for unknown reasons between the 3rd and 10th century. Maybe some artillery fire over the years? Who knows? The Sphinx is the oldest known sculpture in Egypt and archaeologists suggest that it was created in the Old Kingdom using unknown construction methods. Yeah, definitely that battery thing. From 1817 to 1930, this thing was buried up to its neck and written and drawn about for centuries. I wonder what other secrets lay under her right now. I guess we'll eventually find out someday. I wonder what else is just waiting to be dug up, you know? Imagine they find a cell phone. Number 10 starts us with the blame game because it is super important to note off the bat, yes, because of how progressive ancient Egypt was in comparison to other societies, their grievances against women tend to align themselves with either a power play of socioeconomics or adult activities. Aside from that, property and wealth were passed through women, divorce was accessible and easy, and the concept of virginity didn't exist, so you had a lot of liberty, man or woman. Also, you weren't property as a woman, and that's like winning the ancient world's lottery card. However, one thing they had in major common with the other ancient societies is how quick they were to blame things on women. Oh man, a war started because these two dudes are beefing it out over their dad's throne. Must actually be Cleopatra's fault for being so hot. Because that makes sense. Alright, so if the Nile flooded, an angry goddess was to blame. If the pharaoh was killed, his wife had to be involved in the coup. Women were supposed to hold equal standing to men, but unsurprisingly, ancient Egyptian literary texts depict adulterous women as the central figures that disrupt the social order of all of you. Egypt, and thus are deserving of a horrible death for having the audacity taint her husband, nay the world, with her evil doings. Meanwhile, a man or even a pharaoh could be playing the fields harder than a lacrosse team and nobody said boo. In one way, such stories or folktales served as warnings or regulatory mechanisms. In another, they are prime examples of symbolic violence. Women are to be blamed. The blame game is fueled by resentment, the drive of man to be the fastest, strongest, the best, yet they do not have the one truest powers their counterparts hold, a womb, the ability to create and deliver 
your life is something their male gods can do, but the men on Earth could not. If the womb wielders have built-in facet of power you can't regulate nor have yourself, chances are you're gonna be pretty mad about it and lash out in some dumb ways. Such is number nine, which is taken and takers, aka how men controlled the narrative. So in a militaristic society such as ancient Egypt, there is a hierarchy depicted in their literature and art, which Egyptian soldiers are dominant over the enemy soldiers that are subordinated. Intercourse similar to the Greeks was about pleasure, but it was also about the rules of taker and taking. Battle was also about taker and taking. Over time, these two began to correlate with the asymmetrical power relation of gender, and influence how both battle and gender standards are depicted, i.e. the narratives of women, men, and war are very carefully regulated, framing gender through feminization of enemies to show them as weaklings, the taken, that the pharaoh and his men dominated as the takers. These two different hierarchies ended up legitimizing both, thus the defeat of enemies is as normal and natural as the domination of men over women. On the flip side of feminizing enemies in their murals and reliefs and statues alike, there was the absence of their enemies and even their own women. Well, at least from the New Kingdom era and onwards. Aggressive acts or depictions of slayings of the enemy's women were carefully left out of battle representations even though they were depicted earlier and were still referred to in textual sources. Clearly, local Egyptian male audiences did not find it appropriate to depict deeds against non-combatants on the walls of their temples. Another example of women's removal from history would be queens like Nefertiti, Hapshiput, Aksenamun, and countless other leading ladies that were struck out of the records by angry old men. If you want to learn more about some badass ancient Egyptian chicks and more regal ladies like them, maybe take a second to subscribe to The Hive, because we love a good historical feminist. Number eight is about life expectancy, which is determined by looking at the fractures and wear on bones. Analyses of the physical physical evidence of trauma on ancient bones, differences in skeletal markers and occupational stress, and of health status actually do indicate lower life expectancy for women than men in ancient Egypt. Now, class plays a huge role. I mean, yeah, a noble woman is definitely going to live longer than a military man foot soldier, but I'm more referring to how a woman who is physically harmed by her husband could just divorce him and walk away. But a noble woman in the same situation had to endure it due to political ties. For example, a study of 271 skeletons from the Old Kingdom cemeteries at Giza, the highest incident of bone fractures occurs in male workers at 43.75%, while bone fractures occurred in 20.73% of male high officials. Bone fractures occurred in 26.41% of female workers, but only 16.66% of the female elite. The life expectancy of women rounds down 30 years and 34 years for men. The most common killer of Egyptian women was the same as most of the ancient world. Men, disease, and of course childbirth. Women often had numerous Numerous children and these successive pregnancies could be fatal, complications such as perpal fever, hemorrhaging, or postpartum depression. And speaking of bones, number seven is stick stones and broken bones. A study in 2014 comparing the bones of ancient women with those of modern female athletes has shown the average prehistoric agricultural woman had stronger upper arms than the living Cambridge University female rowing champions, who are in their early 20s, train twice a day, and row an average of 120 kilometers a week. The Neolithic women analyzed in the study were from 7,400 years ago to 7,000 years ago, but had similar leg bone strength to modern rowers. Their arm strength though, y'all, these ladies were buff. Their bones were 11 to 16% thicker than in size than that of the rowers and almost 30% stronger. Then there were the Bronze Age ladies from 4,300 years ago to 3,500 years ago who had 9 to 13% stronger arm bones, but their legs were 12% weaker. A possible explanation for these hella arm gains through generations is the tilling of soil and the harvesting of crops by hand, processing milks and meats, fetching water, as well as the grinding of grain for as much as five hours a day to make flour and other things. For millennia, grain would have been ground by hand between two large stones called a saddle quern. The repetitive arm action of grinding these stones together for hours may have loaded women's arms backbones in similar ways to the laborers back and forth motion of rowing. Wow, and nowadays we just doom scroll on Instagram for five hours to get buff thumbs. Dr. J Stocks, the senior on the study, comments our findings suggest that for thousands of years the rigorous manual labor of women was a crucial driver of the early farming economies. And speaking of, number six is the harem gals. As we know from Mike Rowe, it's a dirty job but somebody's gotta do it. The king was considered to be deserving of many women as long as he cared for his great royal wife as well. Everything that touched the person of the pharaoh was meticulously codified and ritualized as a result, starting with his closest family, his wives and their different statuses, main wives, secondary wives, favorites, and then concubines. Being in a royal harem had its ups and its downs. You were pro
property, which is boo, but you were well taken care of, which is yay. The royal harem was installed in part of the royal palace or royal palace complex, as in Thebes or Memphis. Amenhotep III kept his concubines in a palace at Maltaka, which is one of the most opulent in the history of Egypt. Alongside these fixed harems, there were also traveling harems with a crew, so that the pharaoh's companions could follow him more comfortably during his many trips. Moreover, it was an opportunity to siphon different cities that had the honor of hosting them. Huh? Smart, smart. You bring a band of hot ladies wherever you go, and you make a buck off of any noble trying to experience the pleasures of a different land. However, unlike the wives and other women the pharaoh pursued, these were the only ladies unable to say no. The rule is to be a temptation, and as a result of being temptations of the harem, the pharaoh could boast an abundant amount of offspring, like Ramesses II, who had no less than 85 children. And unfortunate women, as said, could die from complications or rampantly transmitted diseases. Let's be real. Can't tell me crabs wasn't an issue in like 6th century BCE. Number five, fake beard. I need one of these because, uh, yeah, I tried recently and it disappeared off the channel. I was too, I was too ashamed to come back. Long before Cleopatra, Hepshaput was the first woman to obtain power as a pharaoh. This is pretty impressive. She was the sixth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. There were just a few that were women in total, but during her reign back in the mid 1400s BC, following the death of Thutmose II, she was determined on being portrayed as a male, as a male pharaoh. So the pharaoh fake beard, the massive muscles, historians believe that this was done as an act of politics. Now after her passing come 1458 BC, her stepson took the throne, Thutmose III, and he destroyed everything in her name. He, yeah, just scripted, back then it wasn't, you know, hard to just, you break one thing and then everything's gone. Well, mostly everything. Now we have this idiot being like, hey, fake beards, look at that, you missed one. Number four, game night. I love board games, even Monopoly, believe it or not. I have the patience for it every now and then. But ancient Egyptians, they also fancied a board game, turns out, who knew? Dogs and Jackals, Mahen, Senate, and 20 Squares. These were all popular go-to games for their ancient Egyptian cottage weekends. Mahen was played around 2500 BC, and the goal was to reach the center of the spiral first. The board was a coiled snake almost. It was quite beautiful. Senate was the most popular game. Queens and kings alike would play this one. Senate had a long board with 30 squares painted on it. Now, of course, the rules are still unknown and heavily debated, just like Monopoly. But you had three rows of 10 squares. The last five squares are decorated, so it's assumed that this game was themed on the afterlife. Plus, King Tut was buried with one of these game boards. There's something very Jumanji about this that I want to know more of, but I also don't want to know more of. Why was he buried with a board game? That's kind of terrifying. There's also some paintings of Queen Nefertiti playing a board game of sorts. Yeah, it kind of looks a lot like chess. Imagine playing a pharaoh in chess. My palms would be so sweaty. I'd be like, checkmate, please don't exile me. Thanks so much. Let's play again sometime. Peace. Number three, the first peace treaty. Bizarre at the time? Absolutely. Definitely. This is a first. The first peace treaty in history was back in 1271 BC. Now at this point in time, Egyptians and the Hittite Empire, they were fighting over modern day Syria. Now this conflict had been lasting centuries and come 1274 BC, the Battle of Kadesh was now underway. At this point, there's tons of bloodshed, no clear victor in sight. So what's left to do at this point? A peace treaty, right? Hopefully, ideally, Ramses II and King Hattusili III Third, both negotiated a peace treaty where both sides would aid each other if a third party decided to now get involved. A copy of the treaty can be found in New York right above the entrance to the United Nations Security Council chamber. Pretty impressive. I have a license plate above my room, so that's almost as cool, I guess. It's also in the Guinness Book of World Records as the oldest peace treaty, so that's how you know it's official. Guinness confirms it. Moving on. Number two, renewed passport. Now I'm thinking about where my passport is and I'm immediately panicking. I'm like, oh, which shelf? Ooh. Before our big bad haunting number one, we'll do a fun one with some recent history. This is cheeky. Passports are important and they're a pain to replace. But did you know that you can still get one even if you've been dead for thousands of years? Well, now you do. You just have to be a pharaoh though. That's the only rule. You have to be a pharaoh or some sort of king. Pharaoh Ramses II, we just talked about him, one of ancient Egypt's greatest rulers. He got a passport back in 1974. Insane, the same time my grandma did probably. After being exhumed and put on display for so long, it was decided that it's now time to send this lost king off to Paris to get touched up. Now, obviously, you're not going to list this pharaoh king as luggage. That would be super disrespectful. So the Egyptian government gave Ramses II his own official Egyptian passport for his commute with a photo. 
just in case you didn't know. On the passport, he had his info. It's all great. He has age, very old, occupation, a king. And in case it wasn't obvious, it was stated that the king was deceased. Looking at him, you're like, oh, yeah, certainly. Yeah, go on in. Definitely dead. For sure dead. Don't even have to look twice. We're good. And finally, number one, trusty servant. In ancient Egypt, it was common for servants to accompany their masters into the afterlife. Whenever they go, now you have to go. Horrible, right? This practice reflected the belief that individuals needed assistance and companionship, even in the realm of the dead. Hashtag needy. Servants were considered essential for ensuring the comfort and well-being of the deceased here and again in the afterlife, which doesn't make a lot of sense, but again, a long time ago, different beliefs. They would be depicted in tomb paintings and inscriptions, and their statues or figurines would be placed in these tombs to then serve the deceased. These servants were believed to continue their duties in the afterlife, providing sustenance, performing daily tasks, and maintaining the deceased social status. Like, when does it end, guy? Like, f come on. The inclusion of servants in burial rituals exemplifies the importance of social hierarchy and the idea of continuity in ancient Egyptian culture. So, while it's crazy to us, it's, well, it's very important then. It's quite important now. Kicking off our list at number 10, ancient Egyptian eyeliner. Whenever you see hieroglyphics or any art depicting the great pharaohs, they're usually rocking some impressive eyeliner. They look great, right? Like a 90s pop star, they look awesome. Ancient Egyptians were the OG eyeliner users. They made their own eyeliner from lead salts. And no, before you think about getting creative, do not try this at home. This wasn't an ideal process. See, for starters, these salts were quite high in lead concentration. So in order to avoid that mess, ancient Egyptians first had to process and then filter that lead salt for up to 30 days in order to get the lead levels low enough to even be applied. So you had to plan accordingly. You're like, oh, I have a pharaoh date in 30 days? Perfect. We'll start now. It was a hazard if done incorrectly. Not only was this ancient beauty practice, well, beautiful to look at, but Egyptians also needed eyeliner to protect against sun damage as well as fight off any infections. Yeah, we don't encourage rubbing lead on your eyes today. We have a few different methods on, you know, how to look good. I think. None of them include lead, hopefully, ideally. Number nine, hair gel. Back in my day in high school, I had to use dippity do extra hold hair gel. Yeah, I showed a scale on the side. I always got the five out of six hold. That was good. Six was too much. Nobody ever did the full six. That's crazy talk. But in ancient Egypt, we didn't have styling spiking glue and blasting free spray by DJ Polly D. No, we have that today, unfortunately, but back then, a little different. Back then, ancient Egyptians loved styling their hair, but again, before DJ Polly D was born, what is a pharaoh to do? If the Great Pyramids are any indication, they knew something that we didn't. Ancient Egyptians knew how to keep their hair in one place all day long. And that heat too, how do you do it? My curls, I'm jealous. Their hair styling gel was made with shea butter and coconut oil. But more often than not, they would replace coconut oil with almond oil. So this was a completely natural and strengthening styling gel. Cut to today, we have whatever that is. Psst, ice spray, that's awesome. DJ Polly, psst, no. Number eight coffee scrub. I love coffee. I don't think I love coffee enough to do a coffee face scrub, but hey, never say never. I'll try anything once. Ancient Egyptians would use coffee scrub to reduce inflammation, improve blood circulation, and since it's a ground up material, it's gonna remove those dead skin cells at the same time. Next holiday season, grab your aunt some coffee scrub. Just tell her how it reduces puffiness, improves the skin's texture, all that good stuff. It'll give you that youthful feral look that you've been going for, you know what I mean? Merry Christmas, here you go, coffee on your face. Using grounded coffee powder to explore exfoliate your skin sounds like a new idea. It's certainly a hot trend today. But before TikTok, ancient Egyptians already knew these benefits. Damn, I'm gonna get a coffee scrub. Maybe I'll do it, I don't know. After I'm done this cup, I'll just rub it on my face, on my desk, and see what uh, everyone says. Number seven, dead sea salt. You'll never feel more alive than when you use dead sea salt. Here we go. Ancient Egyptians were ahead of the exfoliation game. Dare I say, they invented it. Not only were coffee scrubs a necessity, but salt from the Dead Sea was one of the most popular ancient Egyptian skincare products ever. We traveled far and wide for this one. Salt collected from the Dead Sea was used to exfoliate dead skin cells, and it was so well known at this point that, rumor has it, Cleopatra herself would travel all the way to the Dead Sea from Egypt just to take a bath. Yeah, let's be honest. After this point, we'd all love a rejuvenating Dead Sea float. That sounds way better than what I've got at home. Well, bathtub. I can't even fit in this thing. Dead Sea sounds way better. I once left a house party early to go have a bath. Swear to God. York University. Dipped at like 10 o'clock. I was like, I'm cold. I'm not doing this. 40-minute walk. Worth it. Leave your friends for a bath. Do it. Number six, 
Wax cones. Head cones, also known as perfume cones, were used in ancient Egypt. You've probably seen them in a thumbnail here at some point. The art depicting head cones is quite unique looking. It's like a pharaoh with a triangle on their head. You're like, what's happening there? What is this? Was like Illuminati? What is this? Long before Pantene Pro-V, when it came to head cleanliness, these triangular wax cones were here to save the day. And they looked pretty fun to use. I don't know. They would just sit on top of your head. You didn't need to mix anything with lead for 30 days or bran or anything like that. You didn't need to put any organs in jars. Just a wax cone atop of your head. Easy. Back in 2019, experts found archaeological evidence that they were in fact used. So yeah, not just a glyph real life history. So I have to bring this up. Men and women alike would wear this cone and your body heat would slowly melt the wax cone down and through your hair. The cone itself was made of oils, fat, resin. It would be placed on their wig or directly onto your head and it would keep melting and refreshing all day long. It's like a little candle almost. A nice little human candle. A nice little Egyptian man candle. As fascinating as ancient Egyptian culture is, I don't think anybody misses wax cones. It's a little easier nowadays. I'm too tall too. I can't have a wax cone. Are you kidding me? It would hit this mic. No way. Number five, let's reuse, reduce, and recycle our rotten food. More questionable cure-alls. As I mentioned in point number eight, moldy bread was used by doctors for medical reasons such as medicine or gauzing techniques. This is because Egyptians, from what we can gather, seem to have figured out the antibiotic properties and believed the exposure of mold to a wound would better aid in the immune system for next time, if not at least help the quicker healing process this time. But Egyptians also reused other rotten foods. For example, sour milk was also used medicinally. Believed bathing in it would help with skin disease or dryness. I mean, all that sand is bound to have a little bit of a chafy effect. Honey, which also happens to be a natural bacteria killer, may not have been rotten, but it was put on open wounds similar to how we use polysporin today. And while rotten donkey liver may not have been medicine, the Egyptians were quick to slather it on their head and get a nice even dye job. Number four in our countdown is a different kind of rotten, the casual neck. The Egyptians were known for their fascination with life, death, and sex. In their beliefs, the god Ra actually created the universe and the first two gods through mass. Osiris, another god who eventually came along, became father to Horus posthumously after Isis had with his dead body. Ra also had with Osiris posthumously, but it seems his use of onion juice worked pretty well and he didn't father any children with the dead body. Now, just because it's in their godly pantheon doesn't mean just anyone was necrophilic in ancient Egypt, but those who were may have had that lust arguably feeling a little more justified in their pursuit of rotten ladies. So, there was an issue with necrophilic towards the deceased bodies of Egyptian women, to the extent that their loved ones began a habit of letting their corpses sit out for two, three days before passing them to the embalmers, so as to dissuade sex. The logic was is that the embalmers wouldn't want to have sex with the body that was already beginning to rot. I mean, they shouldn't want to have sex with the body in the first place, but I guess beggars can't be choosers. Regardless, next and bombers were apparently common enough for the Grecian writer Herodotus, who famously documented a lot of culture practices, to make special note of. Let's take a break from the funky stuff to talk about a different kind of post. Number three, the obsession with cats. Guys, I am super biased to this one. Don't know if you can notice the fine sheen of cat hair I rep, but I'm with the ancient Egyptians on the cat praise. Ancient Egyptians were obsessed with cats and even worshipped them. Believed to be gatekeepers of the underworld, these little beasts were spiritual and metaphorical symbols for Egyptians and they were even believed to be gods themselves. The act of harming, eating, or killing a cat warranted a death penalty as a result. And while adoring your family pet isn't bizarre, the effects of worshipping something are. When the family cat died, every member in the household would shave off their eyebrows to mourn its death. And if a building was burning, people would save the cats before they even put out the fire. Being the first society to domesticate cats, Egyptians used cats for extermination aside from the companionship, which worked so well that their agricultural society dominated that of the Mediterranean for hundreds of years. Of course, there were cons to this obsession. For example, when the Persian invaders showed up using cats as shields, the Egyptian army retreated in fear of killing a cat, allowing the invaders to their soldiers and the pharaoh and take over rule of Egypt. Oops. Unlike other animals, cats were often mummified and buried in tombs dedicated to the goddess Bastet. Recovered cat figurines made of wood, stone, and bronze can be found in museums and collections all across the world. Number two is a modern day medical emergency, but to ancient Egyptians, it was just his time of the month. While it's astounding that medical accomplishments that Egyptians had made, specialized doctors, antibiotics, even surgery, you can see from their 
contraceptives in point six, Egyptians didn't always nail it. In fact, the disease Shitso Matsasia, we'll just call it by its second name, Bilharzia, was so common that they didn't even realize it was a disease, and it infected nearly everyone. How did it slip under the radar though? The side effects of the disease make people feel sick, and it caused blood in their urine and fecal matter. Seeing as menstruation also came with bloody urine and feeling sick, Egyptians simply thought they were menstruating and came to accept that men had to do the same as women. Blood and urine became a normal part of growing up for boys, and Egyptian society was already very big on gender nonconformity, even having records of sex changes, so this really wasn't outlandish thinking to them. In reality, Bilharzia was actually parasitic worms having a field day in their junk. Irregardless, a man peeing blood was even treated as a sign of his fertility. No better sign a man was ready to father a family than being infected with parasites. Man, what a trip this countdown has been. You may be wondering what can take the cake. It's the ceremonial circle in at number one. So as prior mentioned, ancient Egyptians believed Ra to have created much of life and existence through, well, his masturbatory sessions. This was also believed about the Nile River, Egypt's famous river that flows 6600 kilometers before it empties into the Mediterranean Sea. These ancient Egyptians believed that the flow of the river represented the frequency of Ra's ejection. Seeing as the Nile was the source of Egyptian agriculture, it was incredibly important that that flow remained. Well, it's 4000 BC, and everyday people don't exactly see their gods wandering around. So, with their pharaoh being the personification of God, the duty fell onto him. So, once a year in the last month of summer, during the festival Min that celebrated the pharaoh's rule, the pharaoh would approach the Nile, remove his robe, and master. Over the Nile River in a sacred public ceremony. He had a large retinue of men that would also match into the river at the same time as him. Once the pharaoh and his men had, well, finished, any man was welcome to unload in the river too. It was believed that these cultural and religious practices would ensure that the Nile would continue to flow for the next year to come, pun intended. Number 10. Construction. We can't talk about ancient Egypt and the mysteries still unsolved there if we don't start on how the hell these things were built. And also, it's not just like three pyramids. There's 118 of these things. When did they have time to construct all of these? Ropes? Pulley systems? Yeah, I'm not convinced. Ramps? Ramps. Ramps would have been a mile long against the pyramid's height. That's like hundreds of years right there. You ever dug a hole in your backyard? Two feet, it's like six hours right there, and a sore back. Some have theorized a water hydraulic system was used to transport the carved rocks up slopes and tubes with tidal power. Okay, better, better. But like, how did they line up the rocks so perfectly and so square at the top? One inch off and every carpenter knows that's gonna shift everything. Also, the alignment to true north, the odd coincidences with the dimensions resembling the cosmos, they couldn't have known back then, you know? Buckle up, it's only gonna get weirder. Number nine, Chamber of Secrets. In 2017, scientists were able to peek inside the Great Pyramid finally using modern day physics. Particles, actually. What they found revealed numerous hidden secret chambers and rooms that were thought to never exist. The most bizarre discoveries was a massive unknown void nearly 100 feet long that lays just above the pyramid's grand gallery. Khufu, also known as the Great Pyramid, was received the most attention due to its size and age, but it wasn't the only chamber they found. No. Gold, mummies, manuscripts, ancient technology. What lies inside these voids? Also, how the hell did they floor and roof a room that's unaccessible? How do you build that inside such a small chamber already? Muon tomography uses cosmic rays of muons and generates a 3D image through nearly any material. This technology is groundbreaking. Literally. Uh, yeah, yep, yeah, found it. There it is. Number eight, the Saqqara Temple. The Pyramid of Djoser, also known as the Steppe Pyramid, is an archeological site in the Saqqara Necropolis. The discovery of a 4,400 year old tomb now seen as UNESCO's World Heritage Site is the six tier four sided structure, which very well may be the earliest colossal stone structure in Egypt and possibly the world. Stone mounds were made in Europe for millennia, but it was the pyramid shape that started here. It was built 27th century BC during the third dynasty for the Pharaoh Djoser. The pyramid is the center of a huge complex and an enormous courtyard surrounded by ceremonial structures and decorations. Its architect was created from the Egyptian architect himself, Imhotep, the high priest of the god Ra. This guy was like the building manager 
manager, you know? The head architect. In fact, wasn't even found or really even studied till about the 1920s and was recently excavated in 2018. The pyramid went through several revisions over the years and in March 2020, the pyramid was officially reopened for visitors after a 14 year fix up. Check out Netflix, they do a great documentary on this. Number seven, Queen Nefertiti, the queen of the 18th dynasty of ancient Egypt, the beloved royal wife of Pharaoh Akhenaten. Nefertiti and her husband were known for a religious revolution in which they worshipped solely the sun disk Aten as their one and only god. Oh! Blasphemy! She reigned during what was arguably the wealthiest and most lavish period of, of ancient Egypt. Here's the weird part. We don't know where she is. Usually kings and queens are buried in very spiritual, very high ranked places like the royal tomb. Easy to find. But nope, no one can find her. Or even know what happened to her. In 2015, archaeologists thought with high resolution scans, voids that are behind the walls of Tutankhamun's tomb proposed maybe that she was there. Nope, no Nefertiti. In 2003, archaeologists thought through the hair DNA, Nefertiti's Mommy may have been, quote, the younger lady. Nope. Turns out it was just Tutankhamun's mom. So what exactly happened to this famously revered queen? Who knows? Aliens, dude. When in doubt, always aliens. You know what I mean? Number six, King Tut's death. When archaeologists opened a sarcophagus in Egypt's Valley of the Kings for the first time in 1923, it was the discovery of a lifetime. The ancient Egyptian boy king, King Tutankhamun, the burial chamber of the 19 year old who ruled 3,300 years ago. But why did he die so young? DNA tests and CT scans show he suffered from malaria, a broken leg, and congenital deformities associated with inbreeding, common amongst royalty. Ouch. Because of his tomb's extremely small size, historians think King Tut's death must have been unexpected and his burial rushed by A, who succeeded him as a pharaoh. The tomb's chambers were packed to the brim with more than 5,000 artifacts, including furniture, chariots, clothes, weapons, and 130 of the king's walking sticks. A 24 pound solid gold mask was placed over him and he was laid in a series of containers, three golden coffins and a granite sarcophagus. His death still has scientists scratching their heads. Also, look up how many archeologists died months after the cursed tomb had been raided. Yeah, you don't want to know. And like mother, like son, let's talk about the death of Caesarian. Because in 48 BC, Egyptian leader Cleopatra one day has an idea. Nude, she gets wrapped up in a carpet and her servant FedExes her over to the Roman leader Caesar's crib, where he unfurls the carpet and bam, smoking hot young naked chick. Thinking like the CEO of Hooters restaurants worked like a charm, especially since dirty old Caesar is like 30 years older than her at the time. Their unionizing caused a lot of cr politically, but it also resulted in Caesarian, the pair's only child. He was born in June of 47 BC and only returned to Egypt once Daddy Caesar had been assassinated. But Mama Cleo has big goals. She wants Rome, baby. So she whips her clothes off and tosses herself at Mark Antony, the Caesar successor. He and Cleo establish a union, and apparently she was so good at unioning, he gave her a literal dominion over the massive empire and Caesarian appointed the King of Kings. Ladies, always remember, this works. But as mentioned, August of year 30 rolls around and Mark Antony takes his life and died in Cleopatra's arms. Cleopatra following suit. Plutarch wrote that Caesarian had been sent to India, but also that he was lured back under false promises. Rodden, a tutor, persuaded him to go back on the ground that Octavian invited him to take the kingdom of Egypt. Kid sadly falls for it goes back and his boat touches shore and the Romans descended upon him. Octavian is supposed to have had the pharaoh Caesarian executed in Alexandria following the advice of Arius Didymus, who said too many Caesar is not good. Good homer pun, dude. And yet the exact circumstances of his death and location of his body are not documented. His body has never been found and historians don't know how he died. They don't know where even. They don't know if he was captured and taken to the palace. Maybe there he bartered for his life and was exiled elsewhere, growing up and dying without notoriety. We have no idea. Taking a stroll one minute, dead the next. Poor old archbishop. All right, so it's a little less ancient, but still pretty far back and it's still unsolved. So born in 1893 in the district of Matai, Egypt, Theophilius was taught Copic language and orthodox doctrine from the womb. That's how he ended up being a tonsured reader in 1902. That's someone who read religious texts out loud for folks, since most people were literate. He starts as a monk in a monastery of St. Anthony the Great in 1910, given the mosaic name Monk Peter of St. Anthony. He was then ordained to the priesthood in 1915. Then Theophilius gets another promotion and another. From 1921 to 31, this guy's just hustling through the religious ranks, even being appointed abbot of monastery and being nominated for the Pope on two occasions.
Palestinians. He loses out, but nails the title of Metropolitan of Jerusalem and Archbishop of all Palestine, Philadelphia of Jordan, and all Near East. That's a big one. In 1935, as Metropolitan of Jerusalem, he continued the works and renovations and constructions of the church properties in the Holy Land, just doing a lot of good for his people and community, as all this preamble tells you. But then Monday, October 1st of 1945, Theophilus was popped while walking from the monastery of St. Anthony the Great in the Eastern Desert to the nearby village of Bush. No enemies, no quarrels, angry parishioners. The circumstances and reasons for the killing are unclear, and the perpetrator was never identified. This was also more of an era of knives and bludgeoning, so finding someone who had the right weapon for a bullet wasn't that hard, yet no one had ever been found. Now we're gonna do the opposite and go insanely far back in history. I'm talking pre-dynastic death. They're called the Gabaline Mummies, and there are six in total, all naturally mummified and dating back to approximately 3400 BC, the late pre-dynastic period. This is the first ever complete bodies found from that period, and they were all excavated at the end of the 19th century. In this period, bodies were usually buried naked and sometimes loosely wrapped. When the body's covered in warm sand, the environmental conditions evaporate or drains the water of the body quickly, and the corpse is naturally dried and preserved. It's believed this traditional method was the source for the original Egyptian belief in after-death survival and started the tradition of leaving food and implements for an afterlife. In 2012, they make a unique discovery. A CAD scan of one of the mummified bodies showed that it was a man, aged about 18 to 20 at the time, and hella buff, but also hella killed by someone else. A puncture under his left shoulder blade was made with such force it shattered a rib and punctured his lung. It was believed that the injury was caused by a copper blade or flint knife at least 12 centimeters in length and 2 centimeters wide. The man had been taken by surprise as the attack had no defensive wounds. Naturally, the British government stole these mummies as usual and they remain in their possession and collection to date. But don't worry, the priceless artifacts also found at the graves weren't stolen by the British Museum, just by the British archaeologists and excavators themselves. Now those pieces remain lost forever and since 1901, the first body excavated remained disrespectfully on display in the British Museum. Don't know why they call it that when there isn't a single British item in there. This is an we are still uncovering the secrets of how Ramesses towed the line. I love my puns. This was a very unstable chapter of Egypt's history. The endless war with the sea people draining the treasury, the climate change, political unrest, all the good stuff that leads to a high level conspiracy in 1155 BC. The courtiers, military, sorcerers, harem, hell even his wife Tia was in on this. And sure, while the killers who were wielding the weapons will probably never be identified, an ancient document titled the Judicial Papyrus of Turin details the plot to kill Ramesses III, and that his secondary wife Tia and her son Pentaware conspired with each other against the pharaoh, who had selected an heir from a more senior wife. Alright, so the death itself. 2012 is when a CT scan finally reveals to us how Ramesses died. He had had his throat slit so viciously it severed esophagus and trachea, an instant death. But they also found evidence he was killed by multiple assailants. Ramesses had one of his big toes hacked off, and the wound never had time to heal, meaning it likely happened at the same time as his throat was cut. The shape of the cuts also indicate a different weapon used than the one of the cut of the throat, as does the fact his toes are broken. The likelihood is, is there is an assailant with an axe in the front and one coming from behind with a dagger. Then we learn that the embalmers attempted to hide Ramesses' wounds, performing a little post-mortem cosmetic surgery. They fashioned a fake toe out of linen and covered it with heavy layers of resin, thus why the researchers in the 19th century couldn't get the linens off his feet, and the CT scan revealed to researchers why. Since his slave was so notable, the ancient police and their baboons investigating the death had rounded up just about everyone they could find. Butlers, servants, nobles, and wives. They had plenty of chances to overhear the conspiracy the courts ruled, and their failure to report it made them criminals. As punishment, their ears were cut off, since because as far as the courts were concerned, they weren't making good use of them anyway. The one I'd be most excited to share, since nobody is going to know who I'm talking about, the Takabutis slaying. Egyptian women shaved their heads in order to don wigs. It was better for their scalps under the hot sun, and it prevented diseases and lice. That's what made Takabuti an anomaly. She had her own hair, and it was peach in color. This suggests her hair was of great importance to her, and a cross-section of its DNA revealed something unexpected. Takabuti was somehow African, European, and Asian. How? Mitochondrial DNA allowed for testing to show she's of an ethnicity we don't have anymore. A rare H4A1 halpo group. This halpo group has never been found in ancient Egypt before, so let me repeat that. She's a literal ethnic race of human we don't have anymore, and the first known of their kind in Egypt. Mystery number one down. So how did this lovely lady die? It takes decades to determine that she'd been stabbed from behind, but the weapon was mistakenly thought as a knife at first. Recent discoveries now say a military axe was probably thrown at her from behind as she was running from her assailant. 
Naturally, the injuries from a flying axe hitting you are absolutely brutal, and her death was likely immediate. While the killer is believed to be an Assyrian soldier, Taka Beauty might have faced betrayal at the hands of one of her own people. Egyptian military and their peoples use the same axe as the Assyrians. Ancient Egyptians believed that the soul needed a body to reawaken, thus explained the effort to put in to cover Taka Beauty's wounds with as much resin and linens as possible. The scientists who reconstructed her face noticed its expression was overcast with a shadow of sadness, a reflection of emotion and felt in her last moments. Though Taka Beauty's death was a nightmare, the years hypothesizing and investigating went into finding out everything about her possible. It wasn't just about how she died. They were about how she lived. And finally, people know this woman even lived. Kicking off our list at number 10, the Dendera Light. Here we go. Going back to ancient aliens, maybe, who knows. The Dendera Light is a controversial image found in the Temple of Hathor in Dendera, Egypt. Now, some theories suggest that this image here depicts an ancient Egyptian light bulb or some advanced electrical technology of some sorts, which is pretty exciting. However, mainstream Egyptologists interpret it as a symbolic representation of religious concepts. That makes more sense than ancient Egyptian light brights, I guess. I guess, it's not as fun, but Sure, checks out. The bulb is more likely a depiction of the lotus flower, and the central figure holding a snake is associated with the creation myths. So, yeah, there's some history there. There's some tea behind. There's some stuff you have to know. The Dendera light is a subject of debate and speculation to this day, of course, because people want to believe that this is aliens, an alien light show. But there is currently no concrete evidence to support the claim that this represents ancient Egyptian knowledge of electricity or advanced lighting technology of sorts. Again, part of me wants to believe in ancient light bulbs, but maybe. I've been playing too much Zelda. It's probably it. That's probably that, maybe. I don't know. Number nine, beer. Yeah, that's some pretty good stuff coming up next. Ancient Egyptians, they brewed and consumed beer on a daily basis. Now, they considered it a staple of their diet. Cool, me too, I guess. Beer production was primarily a household activity with everybody in the family helping the process, which is great. That's, what does your family taste like? Let's do it. The brewing techniques here involved fermenting grains, barley, and flavoring the beer with dates, honey, and spices, and pretty much anything you wanted. It's your brew. Get creative, throw, throw random shit in there. See how it tastes. Why not? It's ancient Egypt. Beer had both religious and social significance. Beer would be offered to deities and consumed during festivals and gatherings. Give a, a deity a Coors Light, you're like, here you go. This ought to cool you down. Rocky Mountain certified, buddy. Stop yelling, stop cursing our lands. It also provided hydration, nutrition, and a means of socializing in ancient Egyptian society. So, hard to say no to that. Twist my arm, please. Number eight, curses. Of course, these are, these are real, these are very real. And you'll get cursed if you don't hit that thumbs up. Ancient Egyptian curses are a subject of fascination and speculation, of course. Curses were believed to be supernatural powers wielded by priests or individuals to protect sacred sites and or tombs from desecration. These curses often warned of dire consequences for anyone who disturbed the resting place of a pharaoh or violated these sacred spaces at all. The curses were typically inscribed on tomb walls or objects and invoked the wrath of gods and spirits. Ergo, don't touch my sh Thanks. Many inscriptions contain symbolic threats rather than the direct supernatural actions. So the curse of the pharaohs is mainly associated with King Tut. This curse gained attention when several individuals involved in the excavation of Tut's tomb just died unexpectedly. However, these deaths can be attributed to natural causes or coincidences, of course. But the timing here was a little, it's a little cursed. Nobody really knows, right? We wanna believe. Maybe it's fun to believe. That way we won't steal things from the dead, right? Let's go that way. Number seven, a pet hippo. Are you a dog person? Are you a cat person? How about hippos? They're fun. They'll maybe eat you, who knows? Real quick, do you have any idea how fast hippos are? I had no clue my entire life. I thought they were fat and fun and stationary. No, hippos can run as fast as 50 kilometers an hour. Their bite is three times as powerful as the bite of a lion's. Yeah, so you shouldn't fuck with them. You shouldn't fuck with them with the pH. <laughs> the pharaoh Menes was Egypt's first pharaoh. We refer to him as the lost pharaoh because, well, for starters, he was alive a very long time ago, 3000 BC, don't know much about him, but also he was killed by his pet hippo, therefore definitely lost. We lost him fast, fast and loud. This king spent over 60 years on the throne, and after all of that, all the wars and conquests and all the treaties, after all that, a hippo got him. What a shame. I mean, to be fair, I don't think there's a harder way to go out as a king. A hippo killed you? I don't know. That's pretty badass. That's like top three coolest ways to die next to like the Megalodon. I don't know. Number six, Israel Sphinx Claws. Ah, here we go. So 
ancient Wolverine stuff coming in here. The mystery of the Sphinx claws in Israel. This refers to a set of large limestone claws that were of course discovered near the city of Tel Hazor. Now these claws resemble feline paws of some sort. They're very sharp, very large, very intimidating. And they are believed to have once been part of a Sphinx sculpture. So if someone just took a little bit home with them, that's always nice. The origin and purpose of these claws of course remain uncertain. Now some theories suggest that they were brought from Egypt or represent the influence of Egyptian culture in the region. One of the two. Someone stole it or someone was inspired. One of the two. Others propose alternative explanations such as symbolic or decorative elements. However, without further evidence or historical context, we don't really know because this was, I don't know, 3,000 years ago. Where do these hands come from? They're scary, but we'll never know. They're just fascinating. I just wanted to show you these cool hands. They were good and then they were great and then they were absolute trash. The Amenhotep. All right, so on the top of the bucket, we got Amen one. He's the great, great granddaddy. He effectively extended Egypt's boundaries into Nubia. Next is great granddaddy Amen the second, who was an army leader with famous archery and battle skills. Supposedly, he was able to shoot arrows straight through a thick of copper plates. His athletic ability was incredible, and he was known to have rowed a ship faster than 200 of Egypt's strongest navy men. Next is granddaddy Amen the third, who built himself endless monuments and temples. Perhaps his most famous construction was the Temple of Luxor in Thebes. This temple has become one of the grandest and most famous temples in Egypt. His diplomatic relations allowed art and culture to flourish, and his building projects are legendary. And then there's disastrous daddy Akhenaten, or Amen the Fourth. This nutcase was obsessed with the sun god Atum and changed his name, appearance, politics, lifestyle, anything he could to feel closer to his lord. This pharaoh was so hated that Egyptians themselves wiped his name from their history. He moved Egypt's capital from Thebes to Armana and then renamed it in Egyptian to mean the horizon of Aten and then ordered a new capital city be built there, moving an estimated 20,000 people over to make it. When he enforced monotheism, Og failed to realize that the temples of Egypt were the nation's socio-economic cultural hubs, who was the god priest that oversaw all of their industries. So without them, those pillars of the communities were just gone. And stripping these temples of authority, he caused Egypt's biggest reception. And then we've got the bottom of the bucket, we have our boy Tukmahad, aka King Tut, who by his third year changed his name to Tukmahand and issued decree restoring temples, images, personnel, and privileges of the old gods to undo what his dad had done. He also began the protracted process of restoring the sacred shrines of Amun, which had been severely damaged during his father's rule. No prescription or persecution of Atan though, Akmahand's god, was undertaken, and royal vineyards and regiments of the army were still named after Atan. Tukmahad unexpectedly died in his 19th year, whatever the case, he died without designating an heir. This is another four part family tree. First, great granddaddy Snerfu founds the fourth dynasty and marries the daughter of the last pharaoh of the third empire, thus helped to solidify his possession as the pharaoh of the new dynasty, as well as secure Khufu's place in the line of succession. Meanwhile, his son, who becomes granddaddy Khufu, pops out the great pyramid of Giza, one of the seven wonders of the world. Apparently we were so impressed by this that we forgot to write anything else about him or why he did this because we know very little about Khufu. We know he reigned 23 years between 2500 and 2566 and we know he married his sister. Shocker. Khufu traded for highly rare items, prizing both construction materials and precious materials like copper and turquoise and so he developed the mining industry in Egypt. Limestone and granite were also quarried in vast amounts for rather large building projects that he was working on. Built over a period of 27 years, the Great Pyramid is undoubtedly Khufu's greatest legacy. Khufu's children include nine sons and six daughters, including Defreya and Khafri, who would both become pharaohs following his death. When in power, his son Defreya moved eight kilometers north of Giza and established a new necropolis on a higher leveled ground. Defreya's pyramid was quarried for its stone and as such, there's very little of it left standing today. Meanwhile, the underson Khafri succeeded the short-lived Radifi and married his sister and two other queens who were probably his sisters. Best known for his pyramid, one of the three great pyramids of Giza, and also best known for the Sphinx, which bears his likeness on its face. And who else but the Ramses clan? The Ramses I gets the throne in a super uneventful way. He was friend and confidant to the former pharaoh who didn't have a single heir. Then Ramses spent all of his free time marrying all four of his daughters. Meanwhile, his son, Seti I, led a great army of 60,000 men and fought in many battles north of Palestine and Syria. King Ramses II, son of Seti I, was able to finish his father's
his work by beating the Hittite army in battle of Kadesh and creating the first documented peace treaty in history. Ramses II went on to declare himself a god and rule Egypt for 67 years before dying of natural causes at 90, which is insane in an era where life expectancy was 30. But before getting to that ripe old age, Ramses spent any free time he had chasing anything with two feet and a heartbeat, enough to sire 100 to 200 children in his lifetime. He even outlived 12 of his own sons, leaving no heir. They're back again, the Ptolemies! People loved learning about this batch of literal bastards in the recent top 10 powerful families in history you didn't want to mess with video. Apparently y'all like when I'm doing tongue twisters. For those who don't know why this family could be a tongue twister, an important note is that they always recycled the family names, men always named Platonomy, and women always named Cleopatra or Berenice. They also happen to really, really, really take the old Egyptian ideology of royals only being with other royals a little too seriously. What's created is a massive family tree, one full of manipulation contempt, scandal, and brash killings. While the Platonomies started off strong, building the Library of Alexandria, compiled a star catalog and the earliest surviving table of trigonomic function, and establishing mathematically that an object is and its mirror image must make an equal angles to be a mirror. After the fourth, however, the family became like the Kardashians, talentless and messy. They took up everybody's time, but nobody stopped the free entertainment. So like last time, let me limber up and I'll run us through some of the notorious BS. Platonomy killed his mother who had killed her husband who was having a love affair with her mother and then married his sister Aronso III who was then later killed after Platonomy IV died. Platonomy XII annoyed his children so much, particularly his daughter Berenice IV, that they rebelled against him and drove him from Egypt. Berenice IV ruled briefly. She probably had her sister killed. She certainly had her husband strangled who Kehoner, wasn't a family member. She was beheaded on the orders of her father. Platonomy XII. Platonomy IV 14 was the younger brother of Cleopatra 7, that's the Mark Antony one, and possibly poisoned by that same sister. Platonomy 7 was then killed by his uncle, the next Platonomy 8, at a wedding feast, or he may have been killed by his own father, Platonomy 4. Scholars disagree. It's so messy, my mouth's so dry. Let's go on to the next one. Our favorite bearded lady was part of this family. It's the Thutmose line. Granddaddy Thutmose the first became king after Amenthal died without an heir. Probably one of the previous monarchs generals, he came to the throne around age 40 and is thought to have ruled for a little over 10 years. Historians have generally described Somos too as a frail and ineffectual, just the sort of person that a purposely shrewish hapshaput could push around. Public monuments, however, depict a dutiful hapshaput standing appropriately next to her husband. Wife to Tutu, Hapshaput failed in the more important duty of producing a son. So when Thutu died young in 1497, yet again, the throne went to a harem child. Duly named Thutmos III, this child was destined to become one of the great warrior kings of Egypt, but at the time of his father's death, he was too young to take the rule. As widow, Hat became regent leader until Thut came of age. Within a few years, however, she proclaimed herself pharaoh, a vile absurd. And the seven years past that point, she'd taken up cross-dressing imagery. Once depicted as slim and graceful queen, is now full-blown, flail and crook wielding king with the broad bare chest of a man and the ferric false beard, but also still long flowing hair and feminine features. Upon Hat's death in 1458, her stepson, then likely in his early 20s, finally ascended to the throne. Thutmose III was a skilled warrior who brought Egypt's empire to the zenith of its power by conquering all of Syria and crossing the Euphrates. The spoils from his many wars made Thutmose III the richest man in the world. His military accomplishments are recorded on the numerous monuments he built himself. We're gonna start with how hippopotamuses love you too. One thing that many people don't realize is that the creature that kills the most people in Africa Africa each year, quite literally their most dangerous creature on the continent, is not even a carnivore, it's the hippopotamus, as featured in that annoying Xmas song and that early 2000s Canadian commercial that had us all googling if house hippos are real. To really drill my point in, hippos are the only creature that actually ever scared Steve Irwin. Now, while they may not live on the Nile River anymore today, they certainly did back in the days of ancient Egypt and were sometimes considered a bad omen because of how dangerous they were. They could easily swamp boats, drag people under and drown them. And out of sheer aggression, they could maul people to death with their huge mouths and teeth, even if they had no interest in eating them. As proven by King Tut and King Menes, who both got smoked by these animals while possibly out hunting them, which is something the upper class occasionally did. Call that immediate karma. But deadly creatures could be on a smaller physical scale. Rats and bugs. Most diseases that afflicted the ancient Egyptians, which they also happen to have very little protection from, were transferred by pests. Those who lived near the marshes used nets to protect themselves from the mosquitoes. 
netting around beds, doors, windows, you name it. They also had DIY pesticides for their homes, a solution of Notron or Dobbin and Debit, which is like a crushed charcoal. This mixed powder rub protected them from epidemics and vermin alike. The ancient Egyptians thought that the main reason for the pestilence of the year, which must be the prehistoric terms flu season, was the time of year when dryness and cracking of agricultural lands caused rats to surge up from it. It's also said that the papyrus Silliliere III, that on the 12th day of the first month of winter every year is when disease season began. Obviously they made the connection when you see rats you've got fleas, and when you've got fleas you've got plague. In ancient Egypt the fee of bringing a doctor was very expensive, it could be a copper ingot, a set of vessels, or even, uh, you know, servitude women. This means that when the poor got sick, they would not be able to afford the doctor's fee, and as a result, life expectancy was no more than 35 years for the peasant, while the higher classes lived longer, reaching their 80s and 90s. So how else do you conquer horrible bugs? Why? By shaving every part of it. It was incredibly hot in ancient Egypt, and running showers only cameoed later in the dynasty. For this reason, finding ways to stay cool, stay hygienic, and also avoid awful pests like lice was very important. So ancient Egyptians shaved their heads and the rest of their bodies clean, and we don't mean just the women either. Having smooth oiled legs, arms, and torsos became the Egyptian beauty standard for both sexes. Even for any women or people hearing this who know what it's like to shave more than the 4x4 inch face radius, it can be ridiculous to imagine the chore this must have been for everybody. Shaving your entire body regularly without modern razors, electric trimmers, wax, all while avoiding infection or scrapes on your skins with no water to help. This is where wigs come in. A lot of folks wonder how wigs have become so normalized in our world and ancient Egyptians, really quite a few African continents are the answer. They could be taken on and off, keep your head cool, and they can be tossed into a barrel to be soaked, cleaned, and deloused and worn again. And while I am on a horrible bug roll, worms. Anyone else in Canada forced to read that weird book in high school called The Troop with all those boys stuck on the island with the evil parasitic body infesting worms? No? Nobody? Alright, well while I go to therapy for those nightmares until I'm like 108, let me plant a brain worm on you. Back in the days of ancient Egypt they didn't have the kind of footwear choices we have today. Most people only had very basic sandals and shoes for their everyday work and travel, so foot problems were common and there were ones that were more than just stepping on some shattered pottery or some burnt tootsies from hot sand. Wading into water for whatever, whether it's work, a bath, even just for fun, they had the risk of a shit soma worm getting into their feet and then wreaking havoc on their internal organs, weakening the immune system. Or there's the genea worm, which would hitch a ride in your nose or mouth, travel through your body and eat a path down your leg muscle and lay eggs in them as it goes. They could also get regular old hookworms as well, which could cause iron deficiency, anemia, and all kinds of other love symptoms. Perhaps they should have used some of that magic ancient technology and made more protective footwear so I don't have to think about this for the rest of my night, but no. Huh. Okay, so that was awful. Instead of things that were consuming the ancient Egyptians, how about something they would consume? Sand. Lots of sand. And dude, it effed their teeth right up. Many of our ancient Egyptian videos mention of the incredible innovations Egyptians had in regards to their teeth. They were known for being one of the earliest cultures to use both toothpaste and toothbrushes as well. But this can give the wrong impression. This wasn't a fun little vanity invention, but one of necessity. Sure, they practically had no sugar in their diet, let alone acids, but ancient Egyptians lived in an extremely sandy environment, as we all know. And since they didn't have the insulation, and other vacuums and things we have today, the sand was pretty much everywhere in everything all the time. So yeah, ancient Egyptians were always getting grit in their food, especially their bread, which was the most common thing they ate. This, along with the regularly enjoyed beer, also full of sand, led to some really bad dental problems that they were constantly trying to find solutions for, such as their braces, tooth removal, infection care, and naturally, toothbrush and toothpaste invention. Number 5. Get to work. Also speaking of movies, you know that classic scene where the prison Prisoners are out on work duty. Everyone's in their like orange jumpsuits. They're cleaning up all the garbage. Okay, that. But ancient. A lot of criminals, thieves, and no good rotten folks were used for hard manual labor. Pretty classic. And you guessed it, building the pyramids. While the pyramids are often misconceived of being built by YouTube's least favorite S word, it was most likely built by a combination of people, mostly crafted skillsmen and builders, followed by crooks and those wishing to get out of the hot, hot sun. The job was dangerous, hot, like I said, and oftentimes heavy lifting. Too much for me. 
While normal workers were granted two days off a year because it is backbreaking work, the criminals were tasked with quarrying stone with no days off. No machines, no iron tools. I mean, it's all, oh man, that must be awful. Just the horror. <laughs> just, just the worst. Number four, tarnished reputation. This one actually makes a lot of sense, really. Depending on how heinous the crime is, you wouldn't want this for stealing some bubble gum. So if you found yourself in hot trouble or the principal's office, which I was never in for being a bad boy, I was good every single time, I promise. No one believes me still, but I, I was. The vizier or government would keep track of who's been sneaking in the tombs like Laura Croft. Hence, they could use this information to tarnish your reputation. It was also used against false witnesses and those wishing to gain something from a legal situation. Those that wish to bear false witness would immediately have something amputated because that's the law around here, partner. Number three, Fair Pharaoh. The great Pharaoh Bacchus is an interesting subject to say the least. First off, I had to say his name a couple times before I really understood what was going on there. I blame this Alexia, but that's just how it goes, baby. But secondly, he's the guy that takes power and goes, whoa, 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 guys, maybe not so harsh. And I use this term lightly, but he improved human rights, specifically improvements for prisoners who owe debt. Hmm, sounds like someone might have owed someone a few bucks himself, hmm. Interestingly enough, his laws were influenced by Greek laws, who then influenced more Greek laws, who those Greek laws influenced Roman laws, who then influenced our modern law. There's a, there's a big chain of events there. Trust me, it all matches up. Number two, your nose knows. Knows to stay out of trouble. I saved this one for the bottom of the list because, well, it's just so awful and weird. In a town called Rhinocolora, not too far from Cairo, but 200 miles, was a town full of people with no noses. What? I know. This was a Red Skull Comic Con convention, but a penal colony of sorts, maybe the first. These people were or had been accused of thievery, and for this they had their noses removed to show anyone who visited what kind of people they really were. In a world of infection and disease, I cannot recommend this. It's not a good idea. You, you probably wouldn't make it after they removed it. The name Rhino Cholera, which literally translates to Clip Nose, the town of Clip Nose. That's, that's not good. Number one, in God's hands. Remember before I mentioned the priests used to handle verdicts? Well, it's crazier than you might think, actually. While the Pharaoh was top dog in ancient Egypt, and I mean he was top dog, you don't, you don't get past the Pharaoh, the gods controlled everything and the Egyptians worshipped their gods. Crops, weather, justice, I mean they did everything. So oftentimes the priest's verdicts would come down from the gods themselves. If that wasn't enough, the god Mahis was responsible for those criminals in the afterlife where they would also receive comeuppance. Uh oh, you're not safe anywhere. A sort of jail in the sky, if you will. Alcatraz has nothing on that. You're bad here, you're bad in the sky, you're bad everywhere, bad in the afterlife. So that's why folks, you behave yourselves. Keep your nose, behave yourself. Okay, so let's talk about horrible hygiene. Maybe an over-exaggeration, but hygiene of any kind was better than whatever the hell they were trying to accomplish in Europe without showering. At least the people of ancient Egypt considered it an important enough cultural value that they'd wash once a day. Even if it meant they also shaved their head, crunched down beetles for makeup, and rubbed dung on their acne. 2,000 years before Hesse Ray was credited for being the world world's first dentist, the Egyptians were making their own toothbrush by fraying the ends of twigs. The toothpaste used was a powder like that vegan one at Lush that makes you feel like you're chewing on chalk. It was made of ox hooves, burnt eggshells, and pumice. Mmm, kiss me good morning after you rub that on your teeth with your dental twig, babe. Speaking of, for those whose breath smelled as bad as the armpits of the lower class Egyptians, also had numerous mouthwashes. Some had to be chewed up and spat out like bran or celery. Honey was combined with boiled herbs and spices such as cinnamon and myrrh to form a dehydrated pellet which they also used as breath mints. And speaking of armpit, the Egyptians had a deodorant body rub made of ostrich egg, turtle shell, and roasted tamarisk. Nothing like waking up bright and early for a day of building pyramids and the first thing you have to do is some casual Harry Potter potion making just to not smell like camel crap. Speaking of hygiene, your clothes were never clean. So even if your body was haha germaphobe, you still aren't safe. In the later periods of ancient Egyptian history, 
people began wearing clothes made of linen, not hides, cottons, furs, and rendered leathers like they used to. Linen was light and flexible, so it was good for the hot Egyptian climate. However, linen was white, meaning the clothes showed dirt very easily, an issue they hadn't really had to deal with before. But most materials they'd worn didn't hold up well underwater like linen did, so the ancient Egyptians started doing laundry more often to get rid of the dirt. But they washed their clothes in the Nile, where people also relieved themselves, and dumped garbage, and human bodies. So uh, this meant that the Egyptians washed their clothes in water filled with parasites and bacteria. Even if drying it in the sun baked most of that away, you then still had the world's chafiest linen. To learn who did the laundry, the labor, the provision, and the caretaking, let's discuss family values. You may as well pop a little white picket fence up around the pyramids, guys, because nobody idealized the nuclear family quite like the ancient Egyptians, who held it at the core of their society. There was a tremendous pride in one's family, and lineage was traced through both the mother's and the father's lines. Everyone, even the gods and goddesses, were married. While premarital relations or any romps between unmarried people were socially acceptable, an unmarried man was seen as incomplete, and schoolboys were advised to wed early and father as many children as possible. Once married, however, couples were expected to be sensually faithful to each other. Egyptians, with exception to the king, were in theory monogamous, and many records indicate the couples expressed true affection for each other. Although the institution of marriage was taken seriously, if you don't end up working out with the person you married at 15, shocker, divorce was not uncommon, let alone remarrying, so at least that was one little less impossible thing. Until marriage, following their parents' footsteps, boys were trained in the trades and professions by their fathers and uncles, while girls stayed at home to learn from their mothers. In their early adult years, girls would marry, move from home, and the cycle would start again. Would start again with the dreaded childbirth. Egypt had the highest birth rate in the ancient world, and yet things were far from perfect. Although the Egyptians understood the general functions of parts of the reproductive system, the relationship between said parts were sometimes unclear to them. Like the origin of a man's love potion, since it was white, is from his bones, because those are also white, and nothing else was. Logic, eh? Most married women spent most of their lives either pregnant or breastfeeding. With little medical advice available, amulets and charms bearing figures of the pregnant hippopotamus goddess Tarawet, and the mini demigoddess Bess were often used to protect both the mother and her unborn child, as children of all sexes were valued and desired. The mother prepared for birth by removing her clothing, loosening her hair, or just snatching her wig off. They did wear wigs. The birth of the child was a great joy, as well as a serious concern given the high mortality rate and stress of childbirth on a mother. So a midwife was an important career in Egypt. The everyday mothers squatted on birthing bricks for delivery, wealthy households had specially constructed huts or pools, and the midwife used a sharp obsidian or flint knife to cut the umbilical cord. The midwife was also on standby to try and help in any troubling birth situations that may arise. After childbirth, you breastfed for how long? Next one is latch off already. One of the best ways to maintain a healthy infant under the less than sanitary conditions that prevailed in ancient times was by breastfeeding. In addition to transfer of antibodies through mother's milk, breastfeeding also offered protection from foodborne diseases. If your kid isn't exposed to potentially contaminated food at the time when their immune system is at its weakest, they're inherently going to survive longer. Way of the jungle, y'all. It's why we don't feed babies chicken. Indirect evidence for this occurring in ancient Egypt actually came to us from a number of cemeteries where young adults and unders' death rates peaked at times that correlated with the introduction to solid foods in their body. Prolonged lactation also offered a number of health advantages to you as the mother. Primarily, it reduces the chances of conceiving another child too soon by hormonally suppressing ovulation, which allows the mother more enjoyable stress-free times with her husband between pregnancies. So how long is prolonged? A minimum of a three-year period for suckling was recommended in the instructions of any from the new kingdom, and therefore struck an honestly unconscious but evolutionary important balance between the needs of procreation, the health of a mother, and the survival of a child. Number five, Luxor tomb. We've been saying 2,500 years ago, and don't get me wrong, that's an awful long time to go, but in 2014, archaeologists discovered a 4,000 year old tomb from the 11th dynasty, tucked away in Luxor, Egypt, of course, as this list says. Spanish archaeologists found a tomb belonging to a leader from the 11th dynasty, and it's pretty obvious that this was somebody from the royal family or somebody who was a high ranking official, because at the time, Luxor was the capital city of ancient Egypt, and officials also believe this tomb could have been used as a mass grave. The important thing to know note here is that the tomb had also been used during the 17th dynasty because tools and utensils from that later time were also found in this grave. We're going to find a spork in 5,000 years and be like, ah yes, ancient tools, interesting. Number four, 
210 sarcophagi. So we thought it was a pretty big deal when 160 bodies were recently discovered in Egypt. This was back in September 2020. Over 160 coffins were found. Wild, right? Well, those are rookie numbers, turns out. For this one, archaeologists found 210 sarcophagi near Queen Nefertiti's funerary temple in the city of the dead, Saqqara. Yeah, there were over 160, surprise. Maybe next time you check in with us, that number will be even higher. Who knows? Hopefully, slash maybe hopefully not. I don't know how I feel about this. This was January 2021. We probably would have seen it on the news, but that was when 768 people were storming the capital, so the news was a bit busy, I guess. Thanks. These sealed coffins were untouched for thousands of years. They went from finding 160 to finding 210. That's incredible. According to the ministry, the sarcophagi were completely closed and haven't been opened since they were buried at all. They opened a few though, of course, just to analyze and display them, but that's it. Yeah, leave the rest. I'm not focused on ancient curses or Brennan Fraser having to come out and save the day. Just let dead people lay where they are. Let them rest. The amount of effort got into hiding and preserving their memory alone. I mean, look how long it's taken for us to even find these things. It's almost like they didn't want to be found. Number three, the ancient curse. The walls of some of these tombs have warnings from the gods, which is a lot. One of them warning trespassers that the gods will wring their neck like that of a goose. Also, if I walked into somebody's property now and it said trespassers necks will be wrung out like a goose, I would turn back. I wouldn't want to investigate further. I would just walk away. You don't need to be an ancient god to get that message across, you know what I mean? But inside the found tomb of the vizier Enkimor, a pharaoh's official from 4,000 years ago, a curse was written. Buried in a mastaba, an above ground massive tomb, was this warning. Might do against this, my tomb, the same shall be done to your property. It also warns of the vizier's knowledge of secret spells and magic, and threatens to fill impure intruders with a fear of seeing a ghost. Yeah, there's that, or beware of dog. I don't know, you can pick which is more impactful on your property, sure. Number two, the animal tombs. This tomb was found, as you may have guessed, in the Valley of the Kings. You're getting good, nice. But this one doesn't sound like the rest. I mean, for starters, it's a number rather than a name. What in the Elon Musk is happening here? Whose name was a number, huh? KV-52 was discovered in 1906 by Edward Ayrton. Tomb KV-50, KV-51, and this one, KV-52, they all form a group referred to as the animal tombs. Underneath six feet of debris, the entrance to these vaults were found, so when we enter this tomb, specifically KV-52, that's been untouched, ideally, for thousands of years, we can look forward to finding anything. In fact, whatever we do find, it's a win. It helps complete this age-long puzzle. So when officials opened KV-52 and it was completely empty, well, that doesn't feel too nice. Something here is wrong. It was empty except for two boxes. Both were black and undecorated, which is odd considering what we've learned on this list. The larger of the two contained the remains of a monkey, and the smaller one was a canopic chest that had four compartments in it. Hauntingly bare compared to what else we've seen on this list, but it gets a little better. We're not done yet. Finally, number one, Queen Nefertiti's hidden chamber. When researchers are 90% sure about something, that's a pretty good sign. You only say you're 90% sure of something when you know for sure, for sure. You leave 10% in case anything else goes wrong out of your control, right? 90%, that's confident, we got this. So when Egyptian authorities said they're 90% sure there's a hidden chamber in King Tut's tomb, well, we got a little jazzed, a little, got some jazz hands going on. Not gold, jazz hands. Back in 2015, a paper was published on the burial of Queen Nefertiti. Archaeologist Nicholas Reeves argued that while conducting scans on the ancient site, Reeves found what resembled traces of doors beneath the plaster. Now, it's been considered previously by archaeologists that King Tut's mask, having ear piercings and all, suggests that at that time, that tomb and that death mask was actually meant for Queen Nefertiti, not King Tut. But because King Tut died suddenly when he was 19, plans had to quickly change. 90% sure is good enough for me. What do you guys think? Comment down below all your thoughts. Welcome back to Bumblebee. Look at all you bees back to the hive. Am I the queen bee? I wanna be the queen bee. I don't think I have queen bee energy though. I'm your host, Taylor McWaters. Here are the top 10 scariest traditions from ancient Egypt, part two. Yeah, we're adding some more, why not? Kicking off our list at number 10, afterlife servant. Ancient Egyptians were closely connected to the afterlife, or at least they tried to be. After a loved one passed, ancient Egyptians would ensure that they have everything that they needed in the living world as well in the afterlife, right? Every valuable belonging, everything that you held dear to you your entire life, ideally that's what you want to take to the other side, right? And that also included, sadly, lifelong servants. These masters were thinking about their necessities in the afterlife and of course, being otherwise useless without their servant, they have to bring them too. Now, I know what you're thinking, right? That would probably suck for the other guy, right? Yeah, it did. It really did. Someone dies, now you gotta go too? You're like, what? Forced to be a literal ride or die. That is impossibly unfair. That's 
that's ancient Egypt for you. This tradition thankfully changed before many of these famous pharaohs that we know were put into power. So it didn't last forever, this horrible theme, this idea, but it did happen a lot. Famous pharaohs came into power and this tradition underwent a change, but eventually this practice led to the introduction of number nine. The Shabti. The Shabti were tiny carved figurines that would often be placed inside of these tombs of the pharaohs. Now you've probably seen them at some point and thought that they were just a valued belonging, which obviously they were, but their real purpose was much more grand. These beautiful little works of art were always shaped like mummies and on each and every Shabti carved into them were special instructions that determined what job they got in the afterlife. Yeah, it's like the world's oldest resume right there. Number eight, what's the buzz? Here we go, shout out to all the bees. Cleopatra was the last Greek ruler of Egypt and she had some bold ideas, you could say. So we're not exactly sure of its purpose, but we have some ideas, but there's a large amount of experts that have all agreed that Cleopatra, Greek Egyptian ruler of Egypt, she was known to sometimes fill a small box with a bunch of bees and then shake that box around to disturb said bees. And voila, now we have a very weak massage there's been some speculation as to why she created this bee box and sure you can use your imagination to some degree Probably yes this invention this scandalous idea We're pretty sure it was inspired during her time ruling in Egypt because you know all the bees also to put a box of bees Anywhere near your box of bees. You know what I mean? Bravo. That's brave if she did what all these scholars think that she did with this vibrating box of bees and double bravo That's brave. I don't even go near one bee flying around let alone a box of them. No, thank you number seven shaved eyebrows Ah, <gasps> oh, close one. I thought they were gone there for a second. Look, I love animals, okay? We all grew up with cats, dogs in our family, birds. We had a chameleon at one point. That was interesting. But nobody mourned for their furry loved ones like ancient Egyptians. When the family cat died back then, not one, but every family member involved in the household, they would all shave off their eyebrows to mourn the cat's death. Cats were loved extra hard back then. Yeah, you think cats are spoiled today? When's the last time you saw your friend with their shaved eyebrows after their cat passed away? Yeah, didn't think so. God forbid but if that fateful day shall arrive, commit, you know what I mean? Shave them off, show them your love and shave them off. Number six, stitches. While surgery did exist during ancient Egyptian times, common surgeries, invasive surgery wasn't quite as common because well, one, no painkillers and antibiotics and two, it's gonna hurt and the list goes on and on, it's horrible. But one thing that's less invasive but still quite extremely important back then that was seen quite a bit during these times was the use of stitches. Yeah, probably need some at some point, building pyramids made of stones and rocks, you're gonna cut yourself. Ancient Egyptians found different and effective ways to make their own stitches in order to close these large wounds. They did so by using plant fibers, hair, so gross, tendons, even more gross, and even wool threads. Evidence in different mummified remains have been discovered. Yeah, imagine that, you cut your arm, you have to use someone else's tendon to stitch it up. No thanks, just leave it open, I'm all set. In the oldest known surgical text, which is referred to now as the Edwin Smith Papyrus, that came to ancient Egypt, there are 48 different cases of stitches being described, and they all sound like a great time. One example from the text of treating a laceration reads, quote, if thou findest that wound open and it's stitching loose, thou shalt draw together for him the gash with two strips of linen. Basically says, hey, if you cut yourself, grab a shirt. Good luck. Don't move too quick. Might as well segue on over to number five, which is contraceptives and menstruation. So, fun fact, that whole virginity, oh, deflowering, woe is me, that crap didn't happen. Ancient Egyptians didn't even have a word for virgins. It was literally a free for all until you got married. But obviously, you gotta avoid pregnancy somehow, and when Aunt Flo shows up, you gotta find a way to slap her right back out the door. Women who were menstruating would have been considered impure and excused from activities that had the potential to contaminate other family members. What do I mean by contaminate? They're out here acting like a period is transmittable through air. I guess they thought her essence or sweat or something would ruin the vibes of their Mojo Dojo Casa house because ladies were even banned from cooking. Certain sections of temples would also be off limits to women at this time because we can't have them going and menstruating everywhere. Thus the tampon is born. Using a wooden splint with a softened form of papyrus, they created a bundle and popped her in. And please tell me you remember the Seinfeld episode about the sponge, a famous contraceptive method from the 70s and 80s that was so well loved by women that when they heard it was being discontinued, they bought out all the pharmacies. Elaine in the episode herself buys the last six cases. But like Elaine and the ladies of the groovier eras, the ancient Egyptians had a similar form of contraceptive. Honey, a chia, and colocynth would be soaked in linen and then placed up in the lady parts, just like how a sponge was. Lactic acid, which is found in a chia, is a confirmed man juice aside. Work with me here, people. And colocynth is actually still used today in regions of the Middle East for how effective it is as a contraceptive. Another was intentionally prolonging breastfeeding. Fun fact. 
for my uterus wielding people out there, but lactation prevents pregnancy by inhibiting ovulation. On the flip side, it's number four, how infertility sucks. In a society where intercourse outside of marriage was ashamed or dirty and virginity didn't even exist, it meant marriage actually really was about love, settling down, and children. Considered essential for the continuation of the community. This important requisite resulted in the development of protective deities such as Bess and Thoris. There was also an attempt to understand and manage reproductive process. Medical formula after formula, amulet after amulet, the spiritual petition after petition, they all attested to this concern. For example, experimental marriages existed to help men avoid marrying infertile women. This test period was a year and the experiment ended when a woman became pregnant. Then they'd get married. No pregnancy, he could stay with her if he loved her, but it would be frowned upon knowing that a virile man can have children and still stay with her. I mean, no real downside if he leaves the girl because you'll inevitably find someone who doesn't want kids to sweep you off your feet. And the two of you can have a dual income household filled with cats living the ancient Egyptian dream. So a traditional and ancient method of healing and fertility has been a pilgrimage to a shrine where the journey as well as the offering of prayers, petitions, or in some cases following a prescribed ritual ideally will bestow or heal a woman's fertility. Through divine intervention, if a woman could not cure this, it was believed she was broken, unlikely to wed, and potentially may have spited the gods and thus should be avoided. And if it's not fertility, then your issue may require number three, which is reigniting passion. If a husband's enthusiasm for his wife had dwindled or he found himself struck with the wandering eye, he would be heavily advised to seek medical help. You hear that? You guys hear? all hear that. You heard it? If you're pouting that your wife isn't as hot as the other girlies, don't cheat. Go to a doctor and have them smack you upside the head. Or more accurately, give you a unique medicine elixir, which you'd give to her. Remember, it's the blame game after all. If he's not attracted to you now, suddenly it's your fault, not his. Thank God it's only the most puke-inspiring concoction imaginable, made up of dandruff from the scalp of a killed person, blood from a black dog's tick, a drop of your husband's blood from his left ring finger, and his uh, man juice. No specification, but still had to be fresh or if he had to bring it to the doctor in a little cup. If the wife drank this elixir, it was said the husband should fall back in love. Pretty sure she had to love him a lot to drink that nasty crap and not just get one of those quickie ancient Egypt divorces. If the problem was he couldn't get it up, well, there's a 90% less disgusting hack for that that the doctors would hand over. A mix of powder to chia seeds and honey that he should rub all over down there. Doesn't work, next option is foam from a stallion's mouth, so that first option better work. Number two, they're professional drama queens. Death and birth were big deals in ancient Egypt. If families could afford it, they'd get real elaborate with funerals. Hell, if someone was getting sick, it was tradition for everybody to start putting money aside, which is kind of evil if you think about it, but it would make everyone very comfortable with the concept of death to have it thrown at you this way. So, I mean, whatever works. In Individuals would be carefully mummified by professional embalmers. The body was often decked out in ambulance and jewelry installed in a fine sarcophagus before being interned in a tomb. High class people might even have mortuary temples where priests would offer prayers and goods to sustain the dead person's soul. And some lady you've never seen before who throws herself on the sarcophagus, screaming her damn lungs out while everyone pretends she isn't there and nothing weird is going on. According to the funerary art of ancient Egypt, one of the most striking traditions is that of a professional mourner. These women were paid to act out extravagant grief. In some paintings, they appear weeping and disheveled while touching the deceased's coffin dramatically. Some stories depict them rolling on the ground. Sometimes if a real rich dude died, ladies showed up topless and beset an Anubis mask. Crap could get real crazy. I'd say it wasn't a messed up thing that happened to the ladies, but it definitely was one of the messed up things they did. Don't get it twisted though, I definitely want a professional mourner at my funeral. Last but not least, number one is buried alive. Ah, life of a concubine. As mentioned, crap ain't glamorous physically, but it's at least mentally stimulating. You know what isn't? Being buried alive in a tomb and having to wait out your demise or from starvation or hunger or a deadly snake bite. Who knows? This was very real reality of the concubines and servants until the ancient Egyptians realized maybe it wasn't functional to dispose of an entirely highly trained staff of the previous emperor when they can dutifully serve the next one. So why did the early pharaohs do this? Flaunt some power. Feel a god complex. The belief was that what belonged to the pharaoh on earth also belonged to him in the afterlife. This didn't include material possessions, but people too, like servants and his concubines. This belief enabled the pharaoh to enjoy the same lifestyle in the underworld as he did in the living world. It just meant burying some people alive. The earliest cases date from the late Egyptian prehistory in the reign of Nakata II, when e Egyptologists discovered decapitated bodies found in several cemeteries. King Dejet's tomb had 318 sacrifices with him, but altogether the estimates appear to be much higher, with a possible 580, 20% of which are women. Why did the practice of the retainer sacrifices stop? after the first dynasty? There's no easy answer. As said, it's illogical to dispose of people that way, especially artisans and women.
woman that they needed. So they brought in the cute little Shapti dolls to take that role, and these ladies and servants alike got to continue breathing breaths of fresh air. Number 10 is the Pet Patrol. Do you guys remember the scene in Disney's Aladdin where he steals a piece of fruit and miraculously evades capture? Well, in real ancient Egypt, our prince wouldn't have stood a chance as police in Egypt used baboons to catch thieves. Incredibly intelligent, these animals were able to be trained, which paired with their speed and ability to jump to places that are difficult for humans to reach, made them the perfect crime fighters. Baboons could also easily remember the face of any thief as they are ranked third in the animal world for their memory. So don't go relying on any luck to get away with anything. Outside of their police duties, they were treated incredibly kindly, but trained to participate in picking fruit, making beer, and even dancing. Baboons were so beloved by Egyptians that some mummies were later found to have tattoos of baboons on their bodies. In ancient Egyptian mythology, baboons are best known for their association with Hoth, the god of wisdom. However, they were linked to many other gods as well. Definitely nothing like Babu in Aladdin. But wait, did I say tattoo? Well, being inked up is no modern phenomena. Number nine is tatted up tuts. Egyptians join indigenous, Nordic, African, and many other cultures of having a history of tattooing. Now, Egyptian tattooing was bizarre just because it was exclusive to only women. By tattooing in public regions of the body, the tattoos were intended to permanently mark the woman's association with religious worship, or on the flip side, they could also be used to symbolize the lower class and the mark of a dancing girl or a prostitute. That's what also makes it so bizarre. We can't really figure out why it was only women, what they meant, or what they symbolized beyond the vague generalization I just gave you. Tattooed mummies dating back to the 11th century dynasty have been found by archaeologists, some with religious symbolism, other with dots and swirls located on the lower chest, the abdominal, and the thighs. Some mummies were believed to have been tattooed with medical symbols, potentially to treat ailments. Although the meaning of ancient ta Egyptian tattoos may be unclear, it seems evident that they had an array of implications and that women of many different social classes chose to wear them. Baddies. Speaking of things we can't understand, number eight in our countdown is my favorite pun yet. I put that shit on everything. Except quite literally. Egyptian doctors used human and animal excrement as a cure-all remedy for diseases and injuries. According to Eber's papyrus recording in 1500 BC, animal feces such as donkey, dog, gazelle, and fly were all celebrated for their healing properties and considered to ward off bad spirits. While we know that Egyptian medicine was incredibly advanced, even having doctors who were specialists, you can't help but question this logic. However, like with most things the Egyptians did, technically they weren't wrong. Research shows that microflora found in some types of animal dung contain antibiotic substances. So sure, you risk some tetanus, but you could also be cured. Lizard blood, dead mice, mud, moldy bread were also all used as topical ointments and dressings, and women were also sometimes dosed with horse saliva as a cure for low libido. And speaking of a woman's libido, man, did the Egyptians have some crazy women's healthcare going on. Number seven, we'll call the fertility games. I have a new found appreciation for modern medicine after learning a way our ancient Egyptian friends tested fertility was by placing a garlic or onion clove inside of a woman's. This is because ancient Egyptians believed that all orifices of a woman were connected, kind of like subway tunnels. Anyways, if the doctor could smell garlic on your breath the next morning, then the tubes were clear and the woman was fertile. But if the doctor couldn't smell garlic, then the tubes were blocked and it was assumed that the woman couldn't give birth. Once you are pregnant though, you can find out the sex of your baby in another bizarre tradition, popping a squat over some barley. Why? Because if it barely grew, then the baby was a boy. If the barley grew like crazy, then the baby was a girl. This test was believed to be highly accurate, and they weren't wrong in that. Turns out the test was actually accurate in 70% of all cases. And in 1963 lab testing, the urine of a pregnant woman did cause the seeds to sprout. Since she was in fact pregnant with a girl, it's likely the seeds start to grow faster due to elevated levels of estrogen, which stimulates growth. I can think of some truly hilarious ways to integrate this into a gender reveal party. But kids aren't for everyone, and that's okay. Ancient Egyptians were notoriously not fans of them, so let's talk number six, safe sex. There are actually lots of stories of Egyptian contraceptive methods, but don't get too fascinated because these aren't anything you want to try and recreate. Egyptian women would collect the dung of crocodiles or elephants to mix with sacred herbs and honey. They would then apply this paste mixture to their vulva and up inside the vagina as a protective seal on their genitals. 
Okay. Men, don't think you're getting much better though as your contraceptive was to rub onion juice all over your junk. If neither of these worked, which shocker if they didn't, the Egyptians had an herb called silphium, which was used to help devoid a woman of an unwanted pregnancy. They even knew what has been confirmed today that a chia gum from an achia tree worked as a spermicide and would reduce the likelihood of pregnancy after the fact. While it's impressive they figured out what they did, this whole section just has yeast infection written all over it, so let's just keep going for everybody's sake. Sorostis, the genital king, is number five. Why genital king? Well, aside from being one of the greatest military commanders in Egyptian history, he commemorated his success in a unique way, by setting up a big pillar with a picture of someone's genitals on it. Male or female, he wasn't picky. He sent warships and troops to every corner of the known world and stretched his kingdom further than anyone else ever had, leaving these pillars on sites of every battleground. Aside from genital the pillars were of course ingrained with how he had subdued his enemies and how certain he was that the gods were in favor of his invade everyone policy. Quite cocky of him. The genitals depicted were based off of how valiantly their opponents had fought their invasion. Male depiction indicated that they were strong and brave soldiers, but the female depiction, well, it meant the word that we are all thinking. These pillars lore left all across the continent and they stood the test of time. 1500 years later, after being erected, they still stand in serious engraved with the genitals of failure. Look up the word spoil and you'll see number four is Pepe II. He was the longest ruling Egyptian monarch, surviving 94 years on the throne. The first half of this rule he brought prosperity and grandeur to Egypt. Second half, nowhere close. In fact, it's the mark of the sharp decline of the old kingdom of Egypt as economic disarray was due to him virtually having no oversight. Pepe was made pharaoh in his early teen years, so naturally he got the spoiled brat treatment from mommy. A great example is shortly after being crown, an explorer sent to trade and collect ivory, ebony, and other precious items had written him a letter reporting that he had met a dancing pygmy. Why? This is the greatest thing Pepe had ever heard! He had to see it for himself. So he demanded its transport back immediately and to abandon all precious materials they'd gathered in return for a high reward. Well, he got his dancing pygmy and he got pretty much everything he's ever asked for. He learned to accept that he was more important than other people. By the time he'd grown up, he was so corrupt that he made his serfs strip naked, cover themselves in honey and follow him around just to keep the flies away. Number three is the klepto gaslighting Amasis. He's remembered as a total prick. Amasis actually made his way onto the throne after the current pharaoh had sent him to calm down a rebellion, but when he got there he realized the rebels had a pretty good chance of winning, so he decided to lead them instead. Amasis decided the best way to tell the king about his change of sides and a declaration of war was by lifting his leg, farting, and telling the messenger to take that back to the king. He was a rampant alcoholic as well as a klepto maniac. Apparently he would steal his friends stuff, put it in his own temples, and then try to convince them that they had never owned it in the first place. However, amongst all his bratty behavior, Amasis brought some major reform to oracles. One example actually comes from when he was a poor thief on the street. When he had been caught stealing, he'd been sent to stand in front of oracles who were supposedly be able to divine tell whether he was innocent or guilty. Well, once he was king, he remembered which oracles had pronounced him innocent of the crimes he had committed and had them punished for fraud. Because if they'd actually been able to speak to the gods, they would have known he was always guilty. Number two is cutting down on crime, Actus Sains. Amasis wasn't tolerated for long and he was overthrown the way he'd done to his predecessor. This time the rebellion was led by the Ethiopian Actus Sains, who believed in a gentler approach to kinghood. Actus Sains fought for the crown literally because of a magic spell he'd heard about and also to deal with Egypt's criminals in a flashy new way, controlled exile. Every person who committed a crime he ruled would have their nose cut off and then they'd be sent off to the town he called Rhinoclora, literally the town of cut off noses. It was exclusively populated by these now noseless criminals struggling to survive in the harsh landscape, drinking dirty water and eating trash or the odd stray quail that came through. Something like this may have seemed harsh, but it was actually considered benevolence at the time. Roman chronologers of Rinacola, or Rincolora, whichever it's pronounced, wrote an example of how Actus Sains was actually considering a kindly manner towards his subjects. So keep that in mind when you're doing a comparison of now versus then. And in at number one is Akhenaten. This pharaoh was so hated that the Egyptians themselves wiped his name out of history. Born Amenhotep, he changed his name to a Ahak, I'm gonna call him Ak, in accordance with this radical monotheistic drive. His new name meant that 
He is of service to the Aten. In honor of what he believed to be the one true god, Aten, the sun god, acted everything in the name of the sun god. He moved Egypt's capital from Thebes to Amarnia and then renamed it in Egyptian to mean Horizon of Aten. And then he ordered a new capital city be built there. He chose the site because it was uninhabited. It was not the property of anyone else except Aten. He moved an estimated 20,000 people into this developing city and forced them to build it. These people had to push through everything. Based on the bones found in the town cemetery, more than two thirds of his workers broke a bone while they're working and a good one third of them broke their spines. Almost everyone was malnourished. When he enforced monotheism, Ak failed to realize that the temples of Egypt were the national socionomic and cultural hubs. It was the gods priests that oversaw the industries of agriculture and craftsmanship through their patronage and they who served as pillars of their communities. So by stripping these temples of authority, he caused Egypt's biggest recession and an entire empire nearly collapsed because of him. So it's no wonder after his death, Egypt immediately went back to polytheism and they also abandoned the new city he'd made them build. They destroyed his statues, his effigies, his monuments, and they removed him from their list of kings and history books. In fact, they did this so efficiently that we didn't really even know about him until his remains were found all alone in the city he had forced his subjects to create. All right, so not to toot my own horn, but I think we've got a lineup here most people won't recognize. So let's start with the record. Recognizable King Tut conspiracy. Anything around King Tut is a mystery since the tomb's discovery in 1922. The curse, his age, the disabilities, and most importantly, what the hell happened to the kid? And I'm allowed to call him a kid. I'm older than him, at least in alive years. The reason we can't tell is because there's a couple options for what happened to him. King Tut had malaria and suffered from some disabilities physically due to, well, mom and dad or also auntie and uncle, you know? He had a club foot, a G-way spine, a left palate, so he was always destined to die at a young age, unfortunately. But when he died at 19 in 1323 BC, it wasn't of any disability. His mummy shows that he had a fractured and blood clotted skull, which made people believe he was stabbed or conked on the back of the head. But it was also believed that his head was damaged while his body was being embalmed. But he also broke his knee shortly before he died, in a way that implies he could have been killed in a chariot accident. And then newer CT analysis of scans in 2003 show that Tut was in bombed without his heart and interior chest wall, and that confirms that these structures couldn't have been removed by either tomb robbers or the discoverer Howard Carter. It happened before mummification. Thus now it's suggested that a crushing injury to the chest was cause of death. The extensive crushing and tearing of a hippopotamus bite, that is. So who knows what happened to Tut? Was it a coup, a chariot, a hippo? For now, it remains unsolved. And like Tut, his wife remains a mystery. So up next is what happened to I and Akinsenamun. The coup theory for Tut's death revolved around his elderly chief advisor and successor, I, who is depicted in even Tut's burial chamber, and decided since Tut didn't have kids, he should seize the crown himself. But Tut had a wife, and the kings of Egypt could be a man or a woman. So when Tut died, his wife, Anne, was terrified of the corrupt priests and the rising power of General Horamab, also of being forced to marry a servant such as I. So she writes to the king of the Hittites and offers herself and the throne of Egypt to one of his sons. Prince Zanzananza sets out for Egypt, but is killed when he arrives because Hormab knew An's plan. So who did An have to marry? A, the master of horses and thieves, exactly what she had dreaded, and now a commoner's on the throne. By the way, some believe that I was the father of Queen Nefertiti, and Nefertiti was An's mother. So, do the math. Together, they assume the throne before Tut was even in the ground. I dies in 1319, but Anne vanished from the face of the earth around 1316 to be replaced with his new wife, Tay. History doesn't know where An went. Did A force her to marry him, thus legitimate? his claim to the throne only to kill her? Could she have also been victim of the known serial killer Horambeth? Following the demise of Tut and I, Horambeth did become pharaoh, and while he was, he mysteriously had the names of Akhenaten, Tut, and I removed from the royal list of pharaohs, which suggests he had a personal reason for eradicating those rulers. He also struck records of An, but not the second wife, Tay. There's been no discovery regarding An's death or burial to date, and genuinely no one knows what happened to her. I've made mention of this noble battle before, so let's talk talk about how the Hippo King died. When the mummy of King Sekinenre Tao II was removed from his gift wrap in 1886, he immediately stood out from the other pharaohs discovered alongside him. His skull looks like someone had literally pointed a sandblaster in its mouth and the hands were also all mangled. Also, he showed signs of decay pre-mummification, which was weird for Egyptians.
conditions. But no surviving records shed light on how he met his grisly end. So it was time to play Operation and find out some important bits. And they did. The angles of impacts and a combination of his skulls and Egyptian blades matched the shape of sex wounds all and only to his head. So they CT the skull in 2021 and previously historically reported injuries are all there, but an additional injury on the right lateral side of the skull that had been concealed by the embalmers beneath the layers and the material is finally depicted. But if this was on the battlefield, why were the king's hands tied? Also, why was he attacked by multiple assailants from above while kneeling, which was the position he died in? Hmm. The researchers suggest that Sek was most likely captured in battle against Hykosos and then bludgeoned in a ceremonial execution while his hands were bound behind his back, either on the battlefields or in a dungeon or something. They suggest he died as a result of fighting to liberate his kingdom, also the hippo pool, and rather in a scandalous way such as a palace conspiracy. So while we may have the why and the how of sex death, but we don't really have the who, the what, and the where. So, Yo guys, we got some news. A new mummy just dropped. Hot off the press of 2014, we got a new lineup for the most debaucherous royals around. Said tomb is about 3,600 years old and rests 300 miles from Cairo. And guys, it's the first evidence of the Abdus dynasty that's apparently thrived 36,000 years ago during ancient Egypt's second intermediate period. A necropolis of a lost dynasty that has only been hypothesized to exist until now. Sakembe ruled until around 1650 BC between the Middle Kingdom's end and the New Kingdom start and was found in a 60 ton sarcophagus chamber just absolutely ripped apart by grave robbers and left scattered, undisturbed for a millennia. So how did a whole ass dynasty just go up and missing for 3600 years? And how does a buried pharaoh go undiscovered? for so long. Ancient Egyptians were committed recyclers. Sakembe's giant quartzite sarcophagus chamber came from a royal tomb built originally for a pharaoh called Sobateke, who lived around 150 years before him. Why look where you've already looked, you know? Now for the mysterious death. Homeboy was cut. Up, a total of 18 wounds. Three major blows to his skull have the distinctive scythe and curve of battle axes used during Egyptian second intermediate period. This means like sec, we're looking at a battlefield, ambush, or ceremonial execution, and we have no idea where it occurred or how. Possibly the king died in a battle against the Hykosos king, who at that time ruled the northern Egypt from their capital of Avarius, or in struggles against enemies of south of Egypt. Alternatively, Sakembe might have also had political opponents, possibly kings based at Thebes, who notoriously hated his ass. It had to come up at some point, so let's find out what's up with Cleo. After Roman forces crushed the Egyptian army in the Battle of Atticum, Antony and Cleopatra retreated to Alexandria, where they watched their former allies and supporters defect to Octavian's side and had a two-story mausoleum quickly constructed on Cleo's palace grounds. Hearing a false report that she had died, Antony jumped the gun a little and stabbed himself on the spot with his own sword. His men carried him to Cleopatra and he died in her arms, looking like a moron. Meanwhile, according to Plutarch, a member of Octavian's staff secretly warns Cleopatra a month later that Octavian's taken her to Rome with him. Hell no, I won't go, Cleopatra shuts herself away in the mausoleum with two maid servants, Iris and Charmian, and they sent a note to Octavian saying, suck it, and by the way, bury me with Antony. Octavian's men rush to the mausoleum, bust the door down, find an RA dead Cleo and maids. This is the most repeated theory of Cleo's death, but it's riddled with holes. Apparently, cobra venom did her in, but cobras were too big to be smuggled in, and Venom's actually a really slow death, making it hard to believe the snake was able to kill Cleo and her two maids in the short time it took for Octavian to receive her note and get there. If she did poison herself, there was no way it was snake venom. With no known eyewitnesses to and no primary written records and accounts of Cleopatra's death, pretty much all we know comes from one man, Octavian, who is the main suspect if we look at it as a killing. He certainly had a motive to want Cleopatra dead, as her lineage posed a potential threat to the dominance in Egypt. Looks shady that the second she's dead, too, he directs his guards to hunt down her teenage son. Then Octavian made Egypt a province with himself as emperor. He changed his name to shed the negative image his Octavian title now carried after being suspected of killing everyone's favorite queen. Last but not least, Octavian slash Augustus ensured his version of Cleopatra and her death, snake bite and all, would be written the same in every single one of his subsequent memoirs, so that one very specific version of the story could live on for centuries to come. Because that's not suspicious at all. Now segueing back into the gods, number five,
narrative will be about Osiris and Isis. Egyptian ruler god Ora Osiris and his wife Isis is one of the most well known and revered myths. Osiris was renowned for his intelligence and generosity, two things his envious brother Set lacked. Vying to be king, Set lured Osiris to the Nile, where he enticed Osiris into a coffin and tossed it into the river to be swept away. Devoted wife Isis diligently searches for Osiris and discovers the coffin near Balbos, which is in modern day Lebanon. Isis returned with Osiris's body but concealed it amongst the reeds of the Nile. However, Set had been tracking her and steals the coffin back and chops Osiris's corpse up and throws the pieces everywhere. Isis persisted in her quest for her husband's body. She finds all the pieces, reconstructed Osiris, and bombed his body, got pregnant off of it really quick, and brought his soul back to life with the assistance of her sister Nephesis. Osiris became the deity of the afterlife, ruling over the dead in the underworld. So naturally, that would bring us to number four, which is Horus versus Set. The story is told in the Chester Beatty Papyrus number one, Contendings of Horus and Seth, which dates back to the early Middle Kingdom, but the myth will most likely has origins even earlier than that. So upon bombing Osiris, his son Horus is conceived and then born. Thoth and Shu declare Horus the rightful ruler of Egypt, but Ra argued that Seth was more powerful, therefore deserved the throne. So cue a massive battle. First, they have a hippo breath holding competition. Isis gets involved and as a result, Horus feels betrayed by his mama and cuts her head off. Then Seth gouges Horus' eyes out while he's asleep and Hathor has to return them. The judges wanted the two gods to make amends since crap is getting petty. So they do, but the wily Seth decided to seduce Horus for a scheme. Some very R-rated stuff goes down between the men, but Horus is smart and collects the seed of Seth instead of having it go somewhere else. He brings the seed to his mother, Isis, who proceeds to freak out and cut off his hands. And then she collects some of Horus' seed in a bucket for revenge against her brother Seth for trying to trick Horus. How? She goes to Seth's garden, finds his favorite lettuce, and dumps the seed all over it. So here comes Seth, post lettuce lunch, declaring to the judge council he had performed the labor of a male against Horus, so he should be king. Horus is like, nah, -uh, I did it to him, and the other gods are like, okay, well, let's ask the seed then. So Seth's seed had been discarded by Isis in a marsh, and it responded from there. Well, Horus's seed, eaten on lettuce, replied from inside Seth. So Seth is pissed. He says they need to do another contest. It involves sailing stone boats down the Nile, and Horus cheats, making a wooden boat look like stone. Seth finds out, loses it, demolishes Horus's ship. Finally, enough is enough. They still have been duking it out for 80 years, and everyone is tired. The gods appeal to Osiris in the underworld as the final decision maker, and he obviously chooses his son Horus to rule, not the guy who killed him. Alrighty, up next is number three, and that is the weighing of the heart. According to the story, after death, a person's soul would be carried by the god Thoth to the Hall of Mat, where it would be judged by a panel of gods, including Anubis. Being the deity of embalming and mummification, Anubis played a significant role in the weighing of the heart ceremony. He was accountable for ensuring the deceased body was appropriately respected and readied for the afterlife, as it was he who operated the scales. My personal favorite depiction of this is seen in the TV series American Gods, which paints a visually stunning and poetic scene of Anubis weighing a heart. So the soul and the heart of the deceased would be weighed against the mat feather, which represented truth and justice. If the soul were pure and sinless, it would be permitted to enter the hereafter. But if the soul was laden with guilt, it would be devoured by a meat, a hideous beast comprised of a lion, crocodile, and hippo. This next story is a long-winded one. It's number two, the secret name of Ra. So Ra was known by many names to the gods and humans alike. However, he had one secret name which gave him his divine power. The goddess Isis sought equal power to Ra and devised a plan to obtain that secret name. Having grown old, Ra couldn't speak without spit running from his lips, and Isis one day collected the soil it fell upon. She baked it into the form of an invisible venomous serpent, which she placed in the path of Ra. When the invisible serpent strikes him, burning venom runs through Ra, who collapses in pain. He's brought to his bed and demands all his godly children come to him. His children run to his bed in sorrow, and unto Ra spake Isis, saying, I shall weave spells, I shall thwart thine enemy with magic. Lo, I shall overwhelm the serpent utterly in the brightness of thy glory. Thou must even now reveal thy secret name unto me, for verily thou canst be delivered from thy pain and distressed by the power of thy name. Hotter than fire burned the venom in the heart of Ra. Like raging flames, it consumed his flesh, and he 
suffered fierce agony. Isis waited and waited until Ra, desperate in pain, accedes. It is my will that Isis be given my secret name and that it leave my heart and enter hers. When he had spoken thus, Ra vanished before the eyes of the gods. The sun boat was empty and there was a thick darkness. Isis then received in her heart the secret name of Ra and the mighty enchantress screamed out for the departure of Ra's venom and the relief of his agony. And so the god Ra was made whole once more. The venom departed from his body and there was no longer pain in the heart or any sorrow. He and Isis were now equals. And we've made it to number one, which will be the heavenly cow. Arguably one of the most famous Egyptian legends, its most preserved version is found in the tomb of Seti the first. But all was getting pretty up there in age and mankind, his own creation, stirs up a rebellion against him because of it. Ra is deeply hurt. Mankind sought to kill him and assembled the pantheon of gods asking their advice. Should he kill all of mankind as a punishment or just remove himself as they request? The gods bicker a bit, but the consensus is reached. Let thine eye go forth against those who are rebels in the kingdom and it shall destroy them utterly. When it cometh down from heaven as Hathor, no human eye can be raised against it. Upon the advice of the council of God, Ra sends his daughter Hathor, the fiery protective sun eye, to kill the rebels. The goddess rejoiced in her work and drave over the land for so many nights that she waited in blood. Blood that begins to horrify it all. The god repents, his anger fading, and he sought to save the rest of mankind from his daughter. His messengers run to fetch barley, which is turned into beer and mixed with the already spilled blood of man. He commands the jars then be spilled at the site where the vent for Hathor rested for the night. So that when Hathor awakens, her heart is made glad. She stooped down and in her literal bloodlust began to drink eagerly, not knowing the red fluid was not blood, but beer. By the time she finished, Hathor was too drunk to pay heed to any of mankind and returns to the palace to be with family as they ask her to. Ra, however, is now far too weary to remain among men. He settles down with that family and shares the news of his earthly departure for the sky and calls upon his father Nut and the goddess of the heavens Nut to aid him. Nut takes the form of the celestial cow and ascended up, carrying Ra to become the son of all earths. All right, so the Cambiuses are up first. Cambius was the son of Cyrus the first and the succeeder of his father in Anshan as the king of Agistius of Media. According to the 5th century BC Greek historian Herodotus, Cambius married a daughter of Asidius, by whom he became the father of Cyrus II. Cambius II, aka Cyrus II, performed the ritual duties of the Babylonian king at the important New Year festival of 538 and of 530. Before Cyrus set out on his last campaign, he was appointed the regent in Babylon. That campaign was the conquest of Egypt, planned by Cyrus, and was a major achievement of Cambius's reign once captured. This is the lunatic who liked to torture animals for entertainment and notoriously killed the Apis bull to torment the Greeks who worshipped it. Cambius was traveling through Syria on his way back to Persia when he first heard reports of a revolt there. And then he died mysteriously in Syria in the summer of 522, either by his own hand or as the result of an accident. This is one of the few Persian families to have held the throne, the Xerxes line. First we have the granddaddy Xerxes the first, or the great as titled by the fifth Persian king. He was the son of Darius the Great and his reign lasted from 486 BC to 465 BC. He's well known in history for his attempted invasion of Greece and how later in the same year he was defeated in the battle of Salamis which led him to flee his own kingdom. He's known as both a Persian ruler and a pharaoh as when he ruled Egypt it was also part of the Persian Empire. Little is known about the last years of Xerxes life. After his reversal in Greece he withdrew into himself and allowed himself to be drawn into his harem intrigues in which he was in fact only a pawn. Thus he disposed of his brother's entire family at the demand of the queen. He was assassinated by his own commander of the royal bodyguard forces. Another son, Artaxerxes I, succeeded in retaining power. Artaxerxes I was given the throne by the commander of the guard, Artabanus, who had killed Xerxes. It's fine though because Xerxes Jr. got his daddy's lick back when he kills Arta about a month later. His reign, though generally peaceful, was disturbed by several insurrections, the first of which was the revolt of his brother. During his reign, Artaxerxes completed the Hall of 100 Columns at Persepolis, rebuilt the palace of Darius I at Susa after a fire, and Artaxerxes died of natural causes in 424 BCE, having ensured a peaceful succession 
succession by naming Xerxes II his legitimate heir. Xerxes II reigned for only a little over a month, however, before he was assassinated. Next is the Dossier line. Starting with Dazi Dajer from the Second Kingdom Egypt's Third Dynasty, he undertook the construction of the earliest important stone buildings in Egypt. His reign, which probably lasted 19 years, was marked by great technological innovation in the use of stone architecture. The innovative structure was a departure from the traditional use of mud bricks alongside stone. The greatest advance, however, was the completion of alteration of the shape of a monument from a flat topped rectangular structure known as a mastaba to a six stepped pyramid. This great character built the famous pyramid and set up the construction mechanisms of large buildings, paving the way for successors of their kingdom for even more daring constructions. The Pyramid of Dossier is the first pyramid in history of ancient Egypt and therefore potentially all of humanity. It is a degree pyramid that is at the center of a funerary complex of great importance. It's located in the necropolis of Saqqara. Sekhemet is probably the brother or eldest son of King Dossier. Little is known about this king since he ruled for only a few years, however he erected a step pyramid at Saqqara and left behind a well known rock inscription at the Wadi Makara. No pep in his servant steps for sure, it's Pepe. So Pepe the first kills the game. He does a great job ruling Egypt. He initiated the policy of, of intensive penetration of Nubia south of the first Nile cataract. Inscriptions record journeys southward early in his reign and fragments of vessels bearing the king's name were excavated in Karma. Meanwhile, Pepe the second is the longest running Egyptian monarch, surviving 94 years on the throne. He's also believed to be the youngest ruler ever in Egyptian history. Pepe the second was the son of Pepe the first obviously and was born late into his father's reign. While he was still very young, he succeeded his half brother Marine, who died at an early age. His mother served as regent for a number of years and the old group of officials serving the royal family maintained the kingdom's stability. During the first half of his rule, he brought prosperity and grandeur to Egypt. Second half? Nowhere close. You see a sharp decline of the old kingdom as economic disarray is caused by him virtually having no oversight. Powerful provincial nobles drew talent away from the capital, and because of the unusually long reign of the king, Egypt had a senile ruler when it needed vigorous leadership. Those of Pepe's children who survived him had brief ephemeral reigns and failed to cope with the political and economic crisis that arose as the sixth dynasty ended. His tomb may be more famous than he is, Menkures. His tomb, the Pyramid of Menkure is one of three pyramids of Giza alongside his statue triads that show the king together with his wives and various deities. It's the smallest of the three main pyramids of Giza, just 62 meters tall, but has one of the most complex and best preserved structures. He had two wives, both are his sisters naturally, and they didn't have much luck with sons at first. Three in total and one daughter. At his death, his successor, his son, Shafaskek, completed the stonework walls of the mortuary temple in brick. Menak who was not succeeded by his eldest son, who actually predeceased him, but rather by Shepsake, a younger son. Shepsake built a monumental mastaba at the South Accra and was the only kingdom ruler to not build a pyramid. This family's work, especially the Great Pyramids, show a great mastery of monumental stone working. Individual blocks were larger, colossal, and were extremely accurately fitted. Number five, loincloths. Going back to ancient Roman and also ancient Egyptian times, the loincloth was used by all. Either that or you would just be naked. I found this neat step by step online on how to make your own loincloth, because that's apparently what I do on my free time. Thank you for asking. And it's a bit more complicated than I thought. It's way more it's way more complicated than just throwing on sweatpants or even, you know, the towel fold like a toga. This had numerous steps. We don't have a lot of archaeological evidence because these linens barely made it through a decade, let alone all this time, but ancient Romans would use leather to make underwear. That's a fun little fact right there. Hot goat skin wrapped around your waist in the hot sun. We love it. We still use leather today when it comes to undergarments, but I'll let Adam tell you about that one another time. That's more of a that's more about home one. Number four, food as medicine. Trying to prevent bad things before they happen, it is a very human skill to have. And when it comes to preventative medicine, the Egyptians had some methods. One more obvious solution is diet. Eating the right stuff truly does help lead to a longer life, but eating the specific right stuff can directly prevent certain issues. As a prime example, the laborers that would build the massive iconic structures we know Egypt for today were kept fed with diets that include a lot of onion, garlic, and radishes. Now, I don't know if the ancient Egyptians knew the chemicals these foods contained, or if they just put two and two together, but onions, garlic, and radishes contain. 
why did I do this to myself, contain allostatin, allicin, and raffinin, which are very helpful when it comes to preventing diseases in the super crowded working and living conditions the laborers existed in. That allicin really helps. Another example would be to cure night blindness. In these circumstances, doctors fed their patients powdered liver, which is rich in vitamin A, which is a vital nutrient for vision. Again, I don't know if they knew it contained that specific fang or if they were just like, hmm, I eat liver and I can see better. Discovery! Number three, acne. Ancient Egyptians came up with an interesting method to getting rid of those pimples. Now, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing, and physicians back then discussed pimples as such. Ready for this? They called them these elevated spots with black tops that can plague your skin for four to five years. But by squeezing said spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were referred to as maggots. That's what they thought they were back then. Imagine your partner, hey, can you get this pimple on my back? Yeah, I think I got some maggots, thanks. No, no thank you, that's pretty horrible, that's a horrible reference. They would refer to severe cases of acne as maggots that lie in a bed of roses. I would faint, I would be so sick. If a physician told me I had maggots that lie in a bed of roses anywhere on my body, I would throw up, I'd pass out, I'd be so upset. Dermatological disorders were thought to be human skin taking on the properties of animals. Yeah, you have common acne, mm, maybe you're turning into a pigeon, who knows? Ancient Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds, all to get rid of acne. Yeah, sounds like a horrible alternative. I would much rather just have acne. Maggots? Dude, I'm done with this channel. I'm out of here. That's so gross. Number two, eye makeup. Almost everybody and their mums knows that the Egyptians wore that crazy awesome eye makeup. But what you might not know is that it didn't just serve the purpose of making you look absolutely stunning. No, a lot of these eye makeups were lead based. Now, that sounds pretty bad, I can't lie. It does, and it likely was for some, but it was possible that it boosted nitric oxide by up to 240% in cultured human skin cells. I don't know what cultured human skin cells means, but that's the quote. If you know, let me know down below. What the heck does nitric oxide do? Well, that I do know. It helps to boost up your immune system to fight diseases, which, guess what? That's pretty important, especially in the marshy areas around the Nile where eye infections are actually pretty darn common. What's cool is that research suggests the Egyptians actually knew that and specifically synthesized the makeup for this purpose. Huh, <laughs> neat. Finally, number one, mummification. Back in the day, mummification was common, and even today we're finding more mummies. Like, literally last month, we just unraveled six more. It's crazy. We're uncovering more ancient history, which is great, but how exactly was this process done? We're talking about back maggots and stuff. What, what did they think about this? How did this even begin a, to be a thing? Well, it wasn't cheap for starters. Being mummified was reserved for the rich. It's a pretty brutal process as well. What you would do is you would put a hook, or well, they would put a hook in your nose after you'd passed away, and then they would pull out your brain and all that just squishy stuff, just out all through this thing right here. And then they would cut the left side of the stomach open, remove all those goods, all the organs, boom, see ya, gone. And while those are drying, you would put your lungs and liver in jars. And then you would put the heart back in the body. And then you would wash the insides out with wine and spices, all that stuff, turpentine, turpentines, all the time and teens, just all in there washing it out. Then you'd cover the body in salt for 70 days. That's a long time. But around day 40, you would stuff it with sand. Now come day 70, finally, that's when you wrap them in the mummy bandages. Then the sarcophagus awaits forever, really. And then there's just jars of organs also stored in your burial chamber. Now it's, we don't do it, it's not as fun anymore. We don't put our organs in jars. We don't stuff anyone with sand. We should, you know what? We should bring I back mummies. Let's just do should. it. I think it's time. Yeah. Mr. Unpopular, Xerxes the First is number 10. Xerxes is one of two pharaohs on the list who wasn't actually Egyptian, and it ultimately puts Homi in some hot water. He ruled during the 27th dynasty whilst Egypt was a part of the Persian Empire, having the throne from 486 to 465 BC. These Persian kings were acknowledged as a pharaoh despite not being Egyptian, so Xerxes the Great, as he was known, earns a place on our list by virtue of fame. He wasn't so great to the Egyptians though. He had a disregard for their traditions and religious beliefs and allocated funds away from their temple. He also banged his niece and gave her the robe that his wife had made for him, so his wife had her sister-in-law mutilated as revenge. It was this whole big scandal. But it caused Xerxes' brother to try and usurp him, something that Xerxes was already dealing with constantly as back at home in Babylonia, as well as in Egypt, people were trying to steal the throne away from him, causing him to ping pong 
going back and forth between the two places. When he wasn't doing that, Xerxes was failing disastrously at trying to invade Greece. Eventually, the embarrassment of his consistent failure to do so and the endless coup attempts on him was a bit too much, and Xerxes abandoned the Egyptian throne. His failed attempts to invade Greece ensured that his portrayal by Greek historians and, by extension, the film 300 hasn't been very kind. Number nine is a famous hussy, Ramses II. This man could not keep it in his pants. Sure, 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 sure. He was the greatest leader of the 19th dynasty and an amazing tactical mind and made Egypt prosperous, blah, blah. He's the son of Seti I, and Ramesses went on to declare himself a god and the ruler of Egypt for 67 years before dying of natural causes at 90, which is an insane number for an era where the life expectancy was 30. But Homeboy was not a modest pharaoh by any means. He was a lying, two faced politician who based his entire campaign on a laundry list of fabrications. The extensive architectural legacy of his reign are thought to have left the throne close to bankruptcy at the time of his death. Before getting to that ripe old age, as mentioned, Ramesses spent any free time he had Banging. Enough to sire between 100 to 200 children in his lifetime. He even outlived 12 of his sons. Ramses was one of the first rulers to take on the title of the Great before it was cool. All in all, he was pompous and spoiled. He left behind more statues of himself than any other person in the history of the world. He was obsessed with outshining all those who came before him, and he would tower over all those that would follow. Speaking of testament to ego, number eight is Khufu, the son of Seneferu, which I'm probably butchering, who is the first pharaoh to build pyramids. Khufu was on a one-upping mission since day one. He commissioned the Pyramids of Giza, one of the last standing seven wonders of the ancient world, which by the way we learned not too long ago is lopsided. The pyramid was originally covered in white limestone adorned with gold and since stripped away by greedy tourists over the last 4,000 plus years. He used his platform to also establish mining and trade from what's now modern day Lebanon. Unfortunately, while he brought greatness to Egypt in ways of infrastructure and economy, socially he inspired a lot of mixed reviews due to his use of forced labor and a dismissive nature. The ancient Greek historian Herodotus was a particular critic, depicting Khufu as a vicious tyrant who used slaves to build his great pyramid. Now, many Egyptologists believe that these claims are merely defamatory, guided by the Greek viewpoint that such structures could only be built through greed and misery. If those rumors are true, then Khufu had high expectations and forced labor and no one liked him. If they're not, then he wasn't a bad guy at all. Number seven is Cambyses, the animal hater. This this is the other Persian pharaoh on our countdown, and he too enjoyed picking on the Egyptians he ruled, but in a very indirect way. See, Cambyses enjoyed watching animals suffer. It's said in his spare time he put on fights between lion cubs and puppies and made his wife watch as they t tore each other apart. In fact, nearly every story coming out of Egypt at the time of his rule told about Cambyses involved him ruining the life of one animal or another. Early on, he went to see Apis, the bull that Egyptians treated as a god. Right in front of the priests dedicated to Apis, he pulled out a dagger and just start stabbing the bull until it died, laughing at them and saying, this is a god worthy of the Egyptians. What a prick. Number six is Menkuar, the pharaoh who refused death. Even though the title of pharaoh calls them undying and the pyramids are built to take them to the afterlife, you can't blame a person for still being fearful of what happens after they close their eyes for the last time. 25th century BC pharaoh Menkuar is the poster boy for that fear. An oracle once came to him and reportedly told him he only had six years left to live. Menkuar was terrified and decided to do everything he could to avoid it, even fool the gods. His biggest plan revolved around the idea that as long as night never came, a new day could never start. If a new day doesn't begin, time couldn't pass, so he couldn't die, right? Right. Anyways, on this basis, for the rest of his life, he lit up all the lamps he could and convinced himself it was always daytime. He would not sleep and force countless serfs to suffer with him this way. Every night, he stayed up drinking and celebrating the success until the day he died, because the gods will always have the last laugh. And why not wash all that sand down with a whole lot of flood water? Egyptians actually recorded, measured, and tracked the Nile River, and to do so, they created their own series of measurements, the Nilometer, and a governmental cataloging system that could track the Nile patterns through the centuries of information, the Palmero Stone. While the blessings of the Nile were many, there were such a thing as a little too much. Too high of a flood could destroy dikes, irrigation work, settlements, food stores, and livestock, increase epidemic diseases, and endanger seed stocks. Low or short floods didn't always reach some of the farmlands, which then as a result reduced the wetted area, the degree of soil saturation, and the amount of fertile silt deposited. But it would increase the salt content 
concentration of the waters reaching the fields along the desert margins. This all reduced the cultivated area as well as the unit productivity. Whether too wet, too dry, or too salty, and resulted in food crises ranging from food shortages to straight famine and plague. And naturally, the agriculture and fields were always the first affected by floods, which would immediately affect crop quality, its quantity, and thus income. Some theories mention that the decline after the dynasty and at the end of the Old Kingdom occurred because of food shortages and famines, resulting by the flow inundation. In the tale of two brothers, when inundation confines the men and beasts within doors, the younger brother seats himself at the loom and weaves. Why? Well, this is my smooth segue into talking about how blue collar carried all. As it still does nowadays. Shout out to my blue collar workers, you're seen, essential, and loved. Anyways, to paint a picture, let me read a short segment of the instructions of Duokete, which dates back to the Middle Kingdom. The field hand cries out forever, his voice louder than the raven, his fingers have become ulcerous with an excess of stench. He is tired out and dealt the labor, he is in tatters. He is well among lions, but his experience is painful, the forced labor then is tripled. If he comes back from the marshes there, he reaches his house worn out, for the forced labor has ruined him. This is just one of the many very fun literary resources that detail the haggard existence of the Egyptian blue collared field. There was even an ancient Egyptian papyrus found, and it turns out it's a letter from a scribe of Amun Ra listing reasons to his son why he should become a scribe and nothing else because everything else sucks. In describing the miserable life of a herdsman, it said that they were all worn out with constant toil, bad food, and the dank air of their habitat. He lived near marshes with his cattle. He had no settlement, home, a misery, lonely reed hut sheltered him at night and held all his worldly goods, a rush mat to sleep on, and clay water jar and basket for his head. Sometimes the Nile would flood as discussed and destroy a farmer's whole career. When summer came and the fish left, fishermen had to find new jobs. When drought arrived, artisans and clay makers had to shift focus. To survive, you have to be a master of all crafts, but with a limited education. Thank God you're only struggling to eat, fighting disease, and climate disasters all while getting taxed out the wazoo. So biographies of the Middle Kingdom tombs shed light on the tax collecting activities of nomarchs. While an important administrative text, the papyrus Brooklyn de deals with the forced labor. From this we know until the first millennium BC, taxes were paid in the form of grain, cattle, and other commodities. The first coinage money is introduced in the 26th dynasty. Government officials regulated the yearly taxes, and the officials main function was to ensure that the peasants paid their taxes either by persuasion or even by physical force. Taxes were not based on how much acre that had been produced that year. Remember all that Nile measuring? Surprise! Taxes were based off the result of inundation. Each year, the agricultural census off officials were sent to measure the croppable area and gather a list of the institutions and private owners who held that land. This enabled them to estimate the year's crop and probable tax. Once the crops had begun to grow, other inspectors returned to make the final tax evaluation. Don't pay your taxes? Well, security will swing by with switches, a type of painful stick bundle, and punish you. There were many reasons for not paying taxes. The harvest or the tax itself is stolen from you, too low of a harvest, crop spoilage, and political instability. In the late period, there was also another solution to pay tax or overdue loan, which means to sell yourself for labor. And what do you know? Just like nowadays, unreasonable tax led to heavy corruption, aka royal profiteering, everyone's favorite, and Egypt was full of it. In the case of the whole erecting pyramids and 30 foot self statues, if that wasn't distinctive enough. Following Hashpotet's death in 1458, Egypt's only interest was profiteering, backed by the constant threat of violence. Nothing was done to create a sustainable system of provincial government, instead, a teetering hierarchy of greed, nepotistic officials, and priests squabbled over positions and power. They memorialized themselves and advertised their family's greatness in corrupt expenditures, much like the prodigy houses of the Elizabethan England 3,000 years later. One such official was Rechmeyer, vizier to Thutmose III and his son Amenhotep II. This swaggering bigwig, who literally wore a big wig to prove his status, built himself an extravagant memorial chapel at Thebes and a monument showcasing his status, paid out of the profits of the high office. Because internal theft was endemic, a consequence of staggering inequality pervasive in Egypt at the time. Of course, there's no point in judging a Bronze Era nation by the standards of today, but if but in Egypt, the gap steadily widened as the elite abused its power. Egypt's kings and high officials happily took from other nations and even each other, and kings defaced or demolished their predecessors' monuments, absorbing their achievements and sometimes even helped themselves to rationalize grave robbing. And where there is corruption, there are spoiled Nepo babies. Many, well actually most, of Egypt's kings pretty much popped out of the womb and were sat on the throne. The 18th dynasty is one of the most notorious for this, fathers seemingly dropping like flies and their young sons taking over. But despite literal children taking the throne, the system of divine myths 
surrounding the royal line was so embedded it allowed such young kings to rule unchallenged. War profits were mostly spent on conspicuous waste, but helped create an illusion of permanence. State vanity building projects were designed to glorify the regime as part of that mirage. Amenhotep III built a sprawling palace complex on the west bank of the Nile at Thebes, with courts and pylons fronted by Colossi depicting himself. At Karnak, Hashpotet erected several obelisks honoring herself and Amun, her divine father. Khufu, son of Snerfu, decided to one-up his old man and commission the Great Pyramids of Giza, one of the last standing seven wonders of the ancient world. Pepe II was only six years old when he became king of Egypt, and he behaved exactly as you would expect a six-year-old to. An explorer told him that he had found a pygmy, and he ordered the man to bring it to the palace so he can see for himself. His attitude never changed with age. He was the one who used to cover his servants in honey and make sure that the flies wouldn't bother him that way. And don't forget Ramses II, who was completely obsessed with making a name for himself, building multiple cities in his name, a museum called the Racemium, and he would even quite literally scratch out the names of previous pharaohs and write his own on their accomplishments. The guy was so childish after horribly losing the battle of Kadesh to the Hittites and barely escaping with his life and being forced to sign a peace treaty, he had a massive mural commissioned showing his miraculous triumph. Number 10 on our countdown, the wax crocodile will be presented in a story form. Once upon a time, as all good stories begin, a pharaoh accompanied by his counselors and servants paid a visit to the villa of his chief scribe, behind which there was a garden with a stately summer house and a broad artificial lake. One of the servants of the pharaoh was a handsome young man who catches the eye of the scribe's wife. She sends him gifts and they begin to have secret meetings at the summer house and swim in its lake. The chief butler informs the scribe of his wife's affair and the scribe in turn asks the butler to bring him a magic box. Inside was a small wax crocodile that he placed in the hands of his butler saying, cast this image into the lake behind the youth when he next bathes himself. The lovers were together in the lake the next day and the butler stealthily put the wax croc into the water, which immediately gave it life. It became a great crocodile that seized the handsome man suddenly and took him away. Seven days passed and the scribe tells the pharaoh of the wonder that had been done and made a request his majesty should accompany him to the villa lake. The pharaoh did so and when they both stood beside the lake in the garden, the scribe spoke magic words bidding the crocodile to appear and as he commanded so did it do. The great reptile came out of the water carrying the handsome man in its jaws. The pharaoh was filled with wonder and the scribe related on to him what had happened while the handsome man stood waiting. Could have taken his chance to run, but I guess not. The pharaoh bids on to the crocodile once again to take the handsome man into the depths and neither are ever seen again. Then the pharaoh gave the command that the wife of the scribe should be seized and on the north side of the house she was bound to a stake and burned alive. Now if you want to hear more wild stories like this, I recommend you subscribe to The Hive. For number nine, let's talk about the lore of the Catwoman God. Cats were very important to the ancient Egyptians and were even considered to be demi-deities. Not only did they protect the crops and slow the spread of disease by killing rodents, but they were also thought to be the physical form of the goddess Beset. The Egyptian goddess of domesticity, childbirth, the home, women's secrets, women's physical pleasure, fertility, and of course, cats. It's for this reason she's depicted as a slender and lanky woman with a cat's head. Beset was the daughter of Ra, the sister of Sekhemet, the wife of Ptah, and the mother of Mihos. It's believed that every day she would ride through the sky with her father, the sun god, and a watch over and protect him. At night, she would turn into a cat and continue her duty of protecting Ra, but from his greatest enemy, the serpent Apep. And since we're already talking about it, number eight will be the serpent Apep. According to the legend, Apep was a powerful serpent deity who resided in the underworld and embodied the universe's destruction and chaos. Each night, when Ra's son Bo had to pass through the underworld before re-emerging at dawn, Apep would absolutely hound the ship in an attempt to prevent the sun from rising. Ra, the sun god and king of the gods, fought Apep every night, and the battle was always extremely intense, required all the other gods' help, and lasted the whole night. So to aid Ra in battle, the Egyptians would build wax representations of Apep and melt them in the sun. Finally, it's Beset who conquers and destroys the serpent Apep. During one of these nightly battles, Beset, being the goddess of cats, aided in Apep's defeat by utilizing her powers in a different way than she'd done before. Assuming the form of a lioness, she jumps the serpent, shredding him to pieces and scattering the bones over the underworld. From then on, Ra was tormented nightly no longer. For number seven, you're going to hear the oldest origin of Cinderella and her red slipper. Rhodopis, as she's known to modern storytellers, was a Thradican Egyptian woman slighted by fate and rewarded by royalty. First sold in Aegea, 
Oedipus's past through owners before winding up in Egypt. The Egyptian man who possesses her treats her incredibly fair. He gives her lovely homes, lavish her with other gifts, but he spent most of his time sleeping. So she's sitting on the bank of the Canopic Nile, watching robes when a falcon suddenly snatches her sandal. Rhodopis is in awe, for she knew it was the god Horus who had taken her shoe, but wondering what the Horus appearance could mean. Unbeknownst to her, however, the falcon had taken it to Memphis and dropped the sandal in the lap of none other than the pharaoh Amasis himself. Possessed by the sandal's simplicity, but beautiful red color, and being an obvious sign from the god Horus, the king sent his men in all directions of the country's quest of all directions of the country in quest of the woman who wore it. According to Greek geographer and historian Strabo in his geography book 17.33, she was found in the city of Nocritus. Hearing the trumpets and gongs of the emperor, she had hidden in the bushes while other girls tried to force their feet into her sandal. But the emperor spots her and requests she come out and try it. Naturally, Cinderella style, it only fits her, and she pulled the matching one from her robes. The pharaoh and Rhodopis are united by the god Horus, and the servant girl becomes the next queen of Egypt, to whom Herodotus, Diodorus, and Strabo say the third pyramid of Giza was attributed to. For number six, we're getting another Grecian influenced myth, that of Oedipus and the Sphinx. So, the legend of the Sphinx is a famous Egyptian myth about a creature with the head of a human woman and the body of a lion. Sometimes the Sphinx is also depicted to have wings, but that's more of a Greco Roman component. According to the story, the Sphinx was said to have been sent by the sun god Ra to guard the entrance of the city of Thebes. The Sphinx, naturally, as you may know, guarded Thebes not only with its might, but with its mind, presenting a riddle for all those who approached it. And to anyone who could not answer the riddle, they would be killed. What was the riddle? What walks on four legs in the morning, two legs in the afternoon, and three legs in the evening? If you don't know the answer yet, I actually encourage you to pause the video and try some guesses before we continue. Let's see if the Sphinx would give you the slice and dice. Okay, so the answer is, drum roll please, a human who crawls on all fours as a baby, walks on two legs as an adult, and uses a cane in old age. Tricky, right? So the myth goes that a young prince named Oedipus, yes, the one who marries and does stuff with his mom, uh, came upon the Sphinx while traveling, and he asked the riddle. Oedipus was the first person to be able to answer correctly, which angered and confused the crap out of the Sphinx, causing it to take its own life in a panic. However, some versions of the myth, the Sphinx was said to have been turned to stone by the gods. But don't worry, son, as long as you live, dad's gonna pick your career. Young men didn't get jack bleep in the way of choosing what they wanted from the day their little man got snipped. They were harassed about marriage by their mom incessantly, and dad's always yelling at them for not holding the Dandera flashlight in the right spot so he could see more properly. This is because once a man is viable for marriage, he needs to be prepared to support his partner. A father's rule became about teaching his son's living skill. Herodotus and Diodorus often refer to a hereditary calling in ancient Egypt. Not a system of rigid inheritance of a career, but an endeavor to pass on the father's function to his children. If dad teaches you glass blowing primarily, but also woodwork and butchering, then you're gonna start as a glass blower and use your time outside of it to learn and integrate into the trade you prefer more. Maybe it was butchering or woodwork, but maybe it was something different altogether. A son was commonly referred to as the staff of his father's old age. By mastering his father's trade before one of his own, at ensured as dad ages, son can take care of the family business if it's more lucrative and supports his father better that way. By the way, for this reason, adoption was huge in Egypt. And once you're an adult with a family to support, you'll learn how currency was nightmarish. Up until the time of the Persian invasion in 525 BCE, the Egyptian economy operated on a barter system based on agriculture. The monetary unit of ancient Egypt was the Deben, and it was approximately 90 grams of copper. Expensive items could also be priced in Deben. So, like if a 75 liters of wheat cost one Deben, and then a pair of sandals also cost one Deben, it made perfect sense to the Egyptians that a pair of sandals could be purchased with a bag of wheat as easily as a chunk of copper. Even if the sandal maker had more than enough wheat, she would happily accept it in payment because it could be easily bartered in exchange for something else somewhere else. The most common item used to make purchases were wheat, barley, and cooking or lamp oil, but in theory almost anything would do. Beer was the most popular drink in ancient Egypt and was frequently used as compensation. The lower class of society produced the most goods used in trade and therefore provided the means for the entire culture to thrive. Even if it did mean going to the market required bringing just as many bags of things with you as you were gonna leave with. And since I mentioned beer, life in Egypt would be impossible unless you liked liquor. Wages were paid primarily in grain. Thanks weird Egyptian currency system, just what I wanted to bring home after a 10 hour labor shift. A six pound bag of barley, which was then used to make the two staples of the Egyptian diet, 
bread and beer. Beer was made from barley dough, so bread making and beer making happened simultaneous. Egyptians made a variety of beers of different strengths, which was calculated according to how many standard measures of liquid was made from one hecate of barley. Thus, beer of strength two was stronger than beer of strength 10. These divisions were made because there was no 100% clean drinking water, so everybody of all ages drank beer all the time. And what's beer cause? Bloating, weight gain, heartburn, liver issues. And if you're predisposed to any of these things and you have to spend your life drinking beer, make sure not to jump up and down, you're probably going to combust. But don't worry, if the beer has you feeling like crap, you definitely had access to laxatives 24 seven. An investigation by the UK's University of Manchester and the Egyptian Medicinal Plant Conservation Project provided findings that laxatives were an accessible and normally product by ancient Egyptians. Doctors in ancient Egypt believed the human body should be regularly flushed out to prevent disease and clean the intestines, not just in times of illness. Many Egyptians took this advice and used castor oil to force waste out of their body. Figs, bran, and dates were also used as laxatives in ancient Egypt, and one ancient remedy to relieve excess gas and indigestion was cumin, a hefty portion of goose fat, and milk, boiled together, strained, consumed. Metcalf, a scientist in the Manchester University School of Medicine, adds that the Egyptian use of bowel stimulants such as the bitter fruit coxin and castor oil remained in clinical use until about 40 years ago. So the amount of crapping would have definitely made living in ancient Egypt crappy. And naturally, what's worse than being terrified to leave? Like the people of Mesopotamia, India, China, and Greece, ancient Egyptians lived in modest homes and apartments, raised families, and enjoyed their leisure time. A significant difference, however, is between Egyptian culture and that of other lands was that the Egyptians believed their land was intimately tied to their personal salvation, so they had a deep fear of dying beyond the borders of Egypt. It was thought that the fertile dark earth of the Nile River Delta was the only area sac sanctified by the gods for the rebirth of the soul in the afterlife, and to be buried anywhere else would be to be condemned to non-existence. Those who served their country in arms or those who traveled for a living, saved money, and made provisions for their bodies to be returned to Egypt should they be killed. However, due to this belief, as we know, Egyptians were not amongst the world's great travelers. There's no Egyptian Herodotus, Elvia Chalabi. Even in negotiations and treaties with other countries, Egyptian preference for remaining in Egypt ensured everyone had to come to them. Even within the confines of the country, people did not travel far from their places of birth, and most, except for times of war, famine, or upheaval, lived their lives and died in the same locale. It's believed that one's afterlife would be a continuation of one's presence. The yard and tree and stream you saw every day outside your window would replicate your afterlife exactly. So Egyptians were encouraged to live gratefully within their means and care for their environment and never leave. Number 10, no lice. You know in elementary school when they would check everyone for lice and one poor sucker had to get their head shaved and walk around as that bald kid for like a month and would probably get bullied? Well that ain't gonna happen back in ancient Egypt because everyone shaved their heads to avoid lice back then and priests would shave their whole bodies just like Michael Phelps. Instead of having actual hair of their own, they would wear wigs. Wigs sometimes made of human hair. That honestly was a lot better in that harsh desert sun. Lice and other little pests like that, like fleas, were not wanted. And yeah, they still aren't. But it led to some honestly interesting solutions. For example, a warm potion of date meal and water was believed to drive away fleas and lice. They would use cat's fat to keep away mice, I made a rhyme, and one that probably actually did something was when they used a solution of natron water and salt in their humble abodes to eliminate and repel fleas. Number nine, ancient sunscreen. As soon as summer comes around, game over. I burn so easily. That's why I'm a fan of winter. I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day, all night, and feel like I'm about to faint, obviously. Canada gets quite hot. But how did Egyptians beat the heat in ancient times? What was their trick? They didn't have banana breeze, FPF, SPF 90, whatever the hell it is. Ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty, right? You think your morning skincare routine requires a lot of work? Think again, Laura. Their routine was written on tomb walls and scrolls. Rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma orizinol was used to block the sun off. Yeah, it was that hard. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. And ancient Greeks as well, they used olive oil as sunscreen as well as ancient Egyptians. Which as far as UV protection goes, it did absolutely nothing. You'd be burnt and extremely dehydrated, but also you'd have some nice tan lines and you wouldn't be as pale as me, so it wasn't all bad. Number eight, the finest of cosmetics. The cosmetics of ancient Egypt were not just for looking good, they were for feeling good too. Like on the inside. Now, as such, those professionals who made the stuff took it pretty seriously. 
not just because of a passion for the art, but also because they'd be judged pretty damn harshly if they did a bad job. If they sucked, it would mean having the whole neighborhood give you a bad reputation. And in the cosmetics business, just like show business, it's all about that reputation. It would also mean some harsh judgment from the big boys upstairs, meaning the gods when you met the afterlife. So yeah, they wanted to do a good job. And to meet that end, they would try and use the finest of ingredients, as they should when people have to put this stuff on their skins and right next to their eyes and stuff. Number seven, deodorant. Before the Old Spice guy was born, what did people even do to smell good? What, I don't, what happened? Deodorant was actually first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s. It was called Mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide. It was stored in a metal container, nothing like speed stick at all. It wasn't discreet or anything. It was bad, but ancient Egyptians, Eh, even worse. They had to use ostrich eggs when it came to smelling good in the pits. They made perfumes as well and were among the first to use any type of deodorant. So that's that's a pretty good start. Thank you. Thank you so much, ancient Egyptians. Hence the ostrich egg factor. They had to start somewhere. They mixed a little fat, tamarisk, tortoise shell, and then nuts, and bam, there you go. You're ready for the day. Just pop it on. Another method was a little more yummy than the ostrich eggs and nuts method. Egyptians would use porridge balls. Yeah, flavored porridge rolled up and securely tucked under your arms. Honestly, that seems like a better alternative. Sometimes when you put antiperspirants or like deodorant on, it gets like all, it all crumbles apart. It's like feta cheese all of a sudden. You're like, what happened to this stick? I want, I would rather have porridge balls than just call it a day, boom. Number six, get this man a Tic Tac or something. Just like I use mints to cure my nasty tea breath, which I argue is worse than coffee breath, the ancient Egyptians used breath mints to keep things fresh. Honestly, they actually sound kinda good. Frankincense, cinnamon, melon, pine seeds and cashews put together, ground up and bound together in candy using honey. <laughs> Just heat that bad boy over the fire and let it cool and boom, breath mints. I like it, I like it a lot. These breath mints would be made commercially by those fine cosmeticians and dentists, or they could even be made at home. Some archaeological finds of bowls, jars, and other dishes suggest that they may have been candy dishes that would hold the lovely taste in little suckers. Always gotta keep things fun, fresh, and flirty back in ancient Egypt. Breath mints would certainly help you do the trick. <laughs> nice. Urgency and get an x-ray or a cast and then get your buddies a couple of pharaohs to sign it and get some crutches and be on your way. No. So how did they treat broken bones or dislocations back then? Well, we can look at one example from that Edwin Smith papyrus that I mentioned earlier, where there was a patient with two dislocated clavicles. Now the treatment here is described as follows. If thou examinest a man having a dislocation in his two collarbones, thou shalt find his two shoulders turned over and the heads of his two collarbones turned towards his face. Imagine reading this and you're like, okay, uh, I think we turn this this way. No, this way. Hang on. Thou shouldn't cause them to fall back so that they rest in their places. Thou shalt bind it with stiff rolls of linen and thou shalt treat it afterwards with grease and honey every day. Yeah, if you break something, don't put grease and honey on. Go to the doctors. Hit that thumbs up. There we go. The more we know. Number four, dental surgery. Okay, so back in the ancient Egyptian world, it's not like you can go to the dentist, get your teeth checked and cleaned, whatever, once a year, however you do it, I don't know. And the diet of the ancient Egyptian was most definitely not exactly, you know, the cleanest. If I can say that, you wouldn't have a set of pearly whites every single day, that's for sure. And that's due to the fact that the tools used to grind food would often leave traces of sand and or stone behind, which, well, in your mouth, is not gonna feel too good. That would cause tooth loss or troubles at an early age. Through documents found, there have been a few different dental treatments from that time, and they're a little interesting, like topical treatments and such. But one case was able to give us a glimpse into what is believed to be the treatment of an abscess, and yeah. Buckle up. Even more interesting is a mummy that was found from the fourth dynasty. Now this mummy and his first molar, a bunch of surgically produced holes were there that they believe were used to drain an abscess, which clearly gives us some very tangible evidence that dental surgeries were performed back then in some way, shape, or form. I mean, in the form of a bunch of holes, and it's disgusting, but they tried. And do remember, as you're watching this entire video, all this was done without any anesthetic. So drilling holes, breaking bones, putting linen into your arms, you're gonna feel all of it. Number three, Anubis. Anubis, the ancient Egyptian god of mummification. Yeah, he, uh, he had an interesting hobby, this one. Anubis, historically, he oversaw the embalming process during mummification. A lot of steps involved in mummification, so the backup here, you know, the backseat driving, that is Anubis, I'm sure was appreciated. Ancient Egyptians were so sophisticated in the mummification process that they also had to get really good at another major, well, kind of creepy, surgery, and that is the postmortem dissection. That matters, that's a pretty important step. See, in order to mummify the body, 
they needed to remove any moisture from it. Now this process included the removal of brain tissue, which was done through a quite a gruesome hook tool and some steady hands, that's for sure. This was not a medical practice, however, it was more of a spiritual one, right? It wasn't done by doctors, and this is exactly why they were getting extra up close and personal with internal organs during this process. The medical information they gathered during this process was never used for medical or medical advancement, but rather for spiritual, like Anubis, this ancient wonder. He kept trophies from those that he embalmed, like, you know, different parts from people, that kind of thing. Word spread, you know, hey, Anubis likes body parts, pass it on, this guy's weird. So in turn, for centuries now, Egyptians would then offer pieces of lifeless bodies to Anubis. They're like, you know what, hey, heard you like toes, big guy. Here you go, enjoy, put that in your jar. You love it. Whoever gave him the jackal head, great call. That was a great call. He loves that one, big fan. Number two, dirty trick. The god Osiris ruled over ancient Egypt, but it wasn't an easy path, okay? Just like ancient Rome, there's always a jealous brother or a jealous someone watching from the bushes, okay? Osiris's brother, Set, he was a jealous one. So he tried to take out Osiris at every single turn. Now, what elaborate plot was so crazy that it actually worked? This was like a saw trap set up. This is insane. So first, Set designed a coffin that fit Osiris's measurements, like to a T. So at a party, casually one day, Set challenged Osiris to hop into said coffin, saying, challenging, that if he can fit inside of it, the coffin is his. Yeah, like a gift. So for some reason, Osiris accepted the challenge, he jumped in, and as soon as Osiris got into the coffin, bam, Set locked him inside and threw the coffin in the Nile River. So in turn, Set then took over control of Egypt. Yeah, gotcha, got the last one there. So if any of your coworkers wanna show you a coffin in the break room, respectfully decline the offer. It's, uh, it's probably a trap. And finally, number one, scarab worship. Yeah, we're getting stinky for the last one. Ancient Egyptians, they worshiped scarabs. They worshiped dung beetles. Now, when we think about animals in relation to ancient Egyptians, we go to cats first. But really, it was dung beetles the whole time. They're OG, those little stinkers. Egyptians could not keep their hands or their minds off of dung beetles. The Egyptians would observe scarabs rolling these balls of dung, and they would roll them along the ground until suddenly each beetle would disappear just like that into a hole in the sand. Now, ancient Egyptians compared these patterns to that of the sun. Sun, which of course would go over and then leave at the end of the day. Just the ball rolling and then disappears. I can see the connections. Now the god Kefri was depicted as a man with a massive scarab as a head. So he was responsible for rolling the sun across the sky every single day. And no, the sun wasn't a big ball of poop. It was just a big ball of life. Kicking off the list at number 10, the first zoo. Long before the pyramids were even built, Egyptians were getting quite creative. They were the first to see a petting zoo. How brave is that, if anything? Yeah, let's just start touching animals and then see what happens. Let's do it. 6,000 years ago, Hierakonopolis was the capital of Upper Egypt during the pre-dynastic period. It was beautiful. It was sitting alongside the Nile River, which was even more beautiful back then, you can't even imagine. And in those days, perhaps the best way to flaunt your wealth was by getting an exotic pet. Yeah, the old Mike Tyson trick. There were excavations done back in the late 19th century by English archaeologists James Quibble and Frederick Green, and they discovered that this town was once thriving with over 10,000 residents. It's a lot of people. It's a lot more people than we ever thought. That alone is amazing. That's a historical feat. But when further studies were performed, they also found the remains of an elephant surrounded in cosmetics, surrounded in ivory bracelets and amethyst beads, the whole glorious, you name it, a worshipped elephant. That's odd. Then they found the remains of cats and dogs, also worshipped. The dogs, slightly more worshipped. Common pets, some crocodiles, again, brave owners there. There's also hippos, leopards, wild ox. It was a wild time. They were carefully buried, but the broken bones suggested a cruel history sometimes. But most of the times, they were pets. Not as bad as we thought there. I'm like, oh, ancient pets? No, they're good. A lot of ivory. Number nine. King Tut's passing. Perhaps one of the greatest mysteries is of course the history of the young King Tut. Younger than we remember, honestly. The young boy became pharaoh at just age nine in 1332 BC. Yeah, what were you doing at age nine? I was mini golfing, maybe, I don't even know. During his time ruling, the young king had to face a country in conflict. Egypt and Nubia at this point were going head to head over land, and not even 10 years into ruling, the young pharaoh passed away at age 18. It wasn't until 1922 until he was ever seen again. That's when Howard Carter, of course, discovered the tomb of the lost king, appropriately in the Valley of the Kings. This is where we could have been more careful, you know, historically, because when Tut was discovered, they tried to move his body out of the oil that coated the coffin. But in doing so, they got a little bit too excited. They didn't really know what they were doing back then, so they damaged him. Yeah, they damaged an ancient king. How brutal is that? So now it's next to impossible to tell what really took his life at such an early age, especially for a king. We have some ideas though. It's not entirely hopeless at this point. It was believed King Tut, after some 3D scans were done, had a broken leg. So he may have fallen off a chariot or something. So if King Tut passed at an early age out of nowhere, hopefully this was the reason why or else 
There's another mystery afoot. Number eight, the first peace treaty. The first peace treaty in history ever was back in 1259 BC. Now at this point, ancient Egyptians and the Hittite Empire were fighting over what's now modern day Syria. This conflict had been lasting for centuries. And finally, come 1274 BC, the Battle of Kadesh was now underway. Of course, there was tons of bloodshed, no clear victor in sight. So what's left to do at this point? For the first time ever, a peace treaty was agreed upon. Ramses II and King Hadassuli III both negotiated a peace treaty where both sides would aid each other if perhaps a third party decided to get involved. Involved. They saw their resources, they saw that they were lacking on both sides, so like, hey, we have no we have no shot really, let's just team up. A copy of the treaty can now be found in New York above the entrance to the United Nations Security Council chamber. It's also in the Guinness Book of World Records as the oldest peace treaty ever. That's how you know it's official, if you don't believe me. Every 90s kid watching right now is like, oh, really? Amen. That's a fact, that's a true fact right there. Those holographic covers. What a trip. Number seven, board games. I love board games a lot, even Monopoly. I have the patience for it every now and then. But ancient Egyptians, huh, talk about patience, my friends. They also loved board games. They created them. They got that board, kind of time. Dogs and Jackals, Mehen and Sinet, and 20 Squares, those are the classics. Mehen was played during the pre-dynastic period, around 2500 BC. Now the goal was to reach the center of the spiral, so we think we're trying to piece it together. The board was a coiled snake almost, pretty creative. Senate was the most popular game of all time. Queen and kings alike would play this one. Senate had a long board with 30 squares painted on it. Now of course the rules are still unknown, still heavily debated, just like Monopoly even today. But we have some ideas how Egyptians played it. Three rows of 10 squares, the last five are decorated, so it's assumed, like everything else in ancient Egypt, that this was themed on the afterlife. Plus, King Tut was buried with one of these boards. I'm gonna be buried with a GameCube or something like that. There's also some paintings of Queen Nefertiti playing Senate, so that's how you know it's a good one. It looks a lot like chess. Imagine playing a pharaoh in chess. God, I'd be so anxious. I'd be so nerve wracking. I wouldn't even play checkers with a pharaoh. That'd be too scary. I'm bad at checkers and chess. I don't know how to play chess. I'm lying to you guys. I've never played chess. I don't know how to. Number six, Akhenaten. This queen was ruling during the 18th dynasty of Egypt. The pharaoh Akhenaten, well, this was his daughter. She followed in her father's footsteps and was a great ruler, but she was also the wife and half-brother of one King Tut. A pretty conflicted spot to be in, historically. Her and King Tut had the same father, but their mothers were different. Now, after Tut's death, however, it's believed this queen may have married the pharaoh Ai shortly after, and perhaps she's buried near him right now in the Valley of the Kings. Back in 2010, DNA testing was being done in tomb KV21, and there were two 18th dynasty queens that were recovered from that tomb in the Valley of the Kings. Could it be, perhaps? There wasn't enough data that was found from the mummy, but they do know that the DNA is somewhat of an 18th dynasty royal bloodline, so we're definitely close. In another tomb, tomb KV63, numerous coffins were found, and one had an imprint of a woman on it, along with jewelry, women's clothing at the time, but the biggest clue, really, at this point, was pottery fragments. Of course, it's always in the pottery. We've all played Ogre enough time. Always check the pots. The name Paten was on one of these pottery fragments. That's another clue. The only person to ever use this name, historically, was the long-lost queen, of Akhenaten. So now we're getting real close. Dangerously close. But it feels weird to watch so many tombs be opened up at this point. Like, yeah, we're getting close to finding out things historically, but can we just leave these leading ladies alone? I feel like they dealt with enough men in their lifetime. Now we're just like, Boof. we're like, hey, is that her? Nope, we're good. It's like, eh, let them rest. They have fake doors. They don't want us coming in. Number five. Queen Nefertiti's disappearance. Ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336 BC, Queen Nefertiti, AKA Lady of Grace, AKA Hereditary Princess, was born in 1370 BC. She was born in the Egyptian city of Thebes. She was only 15 years old when she married 16 year old Akhenaten. Again, always so young and just forced, this family forced fun. She worshipped the sun god Aten at the time, and alongside her young husband, she built a new capital called Armana. She even created a new religion, she was onto some good stuff. She ruled over what's now considered the wealthiest period in Egyptian history. Nefertiti had six children, which were all daughters. Many believe this has something to do with her disappearance. After reconstructing Egypt's religious and political structure, soaring to new heights as a woman in the Egyptian court, the queen just vanished. Yeah, historically, just like that, boom. During the 12th year of the 17 that her husband ruled for, historical records seem to have just wiped out the queen's side of the legacy. She was gone from everything, and many believe that she didn't actually die, but rather, she disguised herself and continued to rule. See, the next in line after Akhenaten's reign was Pharaoh Smenkeher. Was that really enough for Titi in disguise? I hope so. That's like some she's the man stuff right there. The reason we believe she may have disguised herself as a man is because of the female pharaoh, Hapshaput. She ruled with a fake beard in the 15th century, so so it's possible, we've seen it. And lastly, there's a theory that the reason Nefertiti was banished was because she couldn't produce a male hair. Like I mentioned, she had six daughters and then she disappeared. 
This is, this is ancient history we're talking about. Always brutal, no matter what. Beautiful, but brutal. Number four, Cleopatra's. Sure, she may have been born in Egypt, but Cleopatra, despite what many believe, was not Egyptian. She was the last Greek ruler of Egypt, and after Alexander the Great's death in 323 BC, Ptolemy then took over Egypt, which in turn launched this wave, this dynasty of Greek rulers that lasted for centuries. DNA-wise, she was barely Egyptian, but as she grew up, she was determined to learn all about Egyptian culture. And due to political structure, she started to style herself after the goddess Isis. She was the first Cleopatra that claimed to be Isis after the third Cleopatra. Yeah, there's way more than we think. There's like seven. Number three. King Ramses VIII, the last son of Ramses III. He's the seventh pharaoh of the 20th dynasty. King Ramses VIII, yeah, history is confusing with these numbers sometimes. I gotta tell you, I had to type that one out a few times. I was like eight, third, carry the eight, nine, Ramses what? The lost king had the throne for a very short amount of time and historians are trying to understand why that is, what exactly happened. When the King Joffrey went wrong with King Ramses VIII here, he was the only pharaoh of the 20th dynasty whose tomb is still lost in the Valley of the Kings. So maybe it's not even there. And the thing is, with his his ruling being so short, the theory out there is that the tomb of KB-19 that belonged to the son of Ramses IX, many believe this tomb was originally built for Ramses VIII, but once he became king, everybody saw his true colors. They must have changed their mind at that point or changed their lane or something. They were like, eh, uh, maybe not him, you know? There is a confirmed tomb that was never used for Ramses VIII, and that was tomb QB43. That was in the Valley of the Queens. It was made for him, but never used. Again, more mysteries. Oh, the poor souls who had to build all these tombs, and they're like, you don't need it? Okay. 57 years to make that tomb. You sure you don't need it? Okay. Number two. Baboon police. Ancient Egyptians worshipped lots of animals. We mentioned that earlier. They had zoos and elephants surrounded in ivory, all that good stuff. At one point or another, you've heard about how cats were highly respected back then, worshipped. But they also worshipped other animals as well. Sorry, cat people. The other animals are fun, like baboons, believe it or not. They were pretty important pieces to this ancient Egyptian puzzle. Egyptians had tattoos of baboons all over them. This was before Harambe, or, you know, anyone monumental like that ever came around. The most famous piece of history that we have preserved is in the collections of the British Museum in London. There's a mummy on display, and it looks a little slightly different than the rest. EA6736, fun name, but he was recovered from the Temple of Cones in Luxor, Egypt. This little man dates back to the New Kingdom period, so anywhere around 1550 BC, to 10 BC. Yeah, he's quite old. Baboons would appear in art and religion all over ancient Egypt, and one of my favorite facts ever has to be that in ancient Egyptian times, pharaohs would train baboons to make arrests. Yeah, imagine stealing food and trying to run away, and then you look back and there's four baboons doing parkour behind you, telling you to stop resisting, hucking bananas at you. That's crazy. And number one, false doors. Imagine searching for a lost Egyptian tomb your entire life, all right? Imagine you spent years of your life dedicating everything to this research, and you finally find this door, this ancient door. You find an entrance carved into the wall. This is it. What lies beyond? You try and carefully open it with a team of archaeologists, but it won't budge because it is a fake door, my friends. It is a false door. Yeah, you just got juked out from a guy 4,500 years ago. He's like, gotcha. <sighs> Took long, we did it. False doors in ancient Egyptian tombs are very common. Ancient Egyptians believed that these false doors were a connection to the dead. How beautiful is that? And that is how spirits were able to travel from here to there and back and forth. See, most false doors can be found on the west wall because Egyptians believed the west to be the land of the dead. The west, that's the west. Which way? Which way is north? Your west, my east. How does that sound? There we go.